Greetings, programs. Welcome to Red Pill Sunday School, Season 2, Episode 3. And that means we're at Part 2 of my audio-video book presentation, which is entitled, again, Straw Man, A Choice Between Two Evils. And that title will become ever more clear as we proceed, and you'll see that's exactly what you have, a choice between two evils or more, at any one time. That's all you have. You have nothing else. That's what it means to be under the legal or, again, anti-good or anti-God law. The anti-moral law. The anti-spiritual law. That's what this means. And so today, without any further delay, we're going to go right into part two of Straw Man. A Choice Between Two Evils. Enjoy. Through causality, that is because of this cultural indoctrination, brainwashing, personhood, that is, which we'll discuss in detail here, we provide the fictional details, the name, the statistics of our legal persona, instead of demanding charity care. So we're back to the notion of free health care. Well, who gets free health care? Men. But if you say you're a person, you give the fictional uh, vital statistics of your legal persona instead of demanding that you're a man of God and require charity, the very purpose, the very reason that corporation was set up in the first place, the Lisa Minori Corporation, hey, you're, you're screwing yourself. In general, this is the number one reason that people go through bankruptcy and death in the United States. It's because they say, I'm a person. I'm not a man, I'm a person. And therefore, you can charge me Whatever you want, you can go and you can get my insurance and the insurance will deny me care. You know, I always, I can't get it because they won't pay for it, etc., etc. Meanwhile, if you were a man, you'd be getting all the care you needed. You needed. Not what you want, not what you think you need, but the life-giving care that you need. Doesn't include plastic surgery or Botox. Doesn't include prosthetics. Doesn't include anything that is not necessary. And so people try to abuse it. So what's the problem? The corrupt hospital who's entered into mammon and seeks to gain even off charity charges the legal commercial person for the services it is required to give freely to all men, non-commercially. See, everything real, including charity, is the intent of it, of, of all these words and all these contracts and legal things is to bring everything into commerce, into fiction. We literally offer up to them this false persona. It's like a sacrifice of our self, our true self. And we say, I am this person. And we offer it as an idol of godlessness. Literally, a sign and token, right? A mark representing the fact that we are not acting as the sons, the men of God, but as agents of the legal nation, the legal system, as willing debtors. People who are not only willing, but it is the right and duty of us to be extorted, exacted from, taxed, right? That's what we're saying. You can't be taxed. This is why in the Bible, Caesar said we should tax, register all men. You can't be taxed unless you're registered as a person of Caesar, now let's put this into the legal perspective. The Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, or EMTALA, guarantees a certain level of medical care to anyone who comes to an emergency department that accepts payments from Medicare or Medicaid. In other words, folks, federal funding. You're a federal person. You're a foreign entity. Some labor and delivery units and psychiatric hospitals are also governed by this law. Under the law enacted in 1986, emergency departments must offer patients a timely and appropriate medical screening exam. Don't ever let them tell you no. No, you're a charity. You don't have a choice. And you should have your charity privileges removed. If that's the case, which means you can't do most of what you do because you have to do charity in order to do everything else. 
This exam is different from triage, in which a nurse or other provider takes vital signs to decide the order in which to see patients. Unlike with triage, a healthcare professional with a certain level of expertise, typically a doctor, advanced practice nurse, or physician assistant, must do the medical screening. So when they, you know, put you in order, you've got insurance, for instance, and some homeless lady has an axe or a knife or something in her head she's bleeding profusely they'll take you first they're not supposed to do that folks <laughs> right because the emergency room is not meant for that the emergency room is charity care period end of story unless they get you to admit personhood to say you're something you're not medical screening exams Okay, but back to that. They must do a medical screening. There is no choice, right? You walk into an emergency room, whether you have identity or not, you must be seen. The only way they can charge you or attempt to charge you is you give them something that's chargeable. Remember, men can't be charged with fictional legal things. Only the person, the legal fiction that they pretend to be can be charged. Medical screening exams are done to find out the cause of a patient's symptoms. They cannot be delayed or denied in order to ask about a patient's ability to pay. This is the law, folks. Now, you've been trying to look down on this. You've been trying to say, oh, those filthy people who don't have insurance, da 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 Well, that's most of the people in the world, folks. So, you know, maybe you should grow up a little. And you should realize there's very little money going to this, by the way. I've... Uh, proven that in past blog posts too medical screening exams must make use of all the hospital's relevant resources for example lab tests or ct scans they cannot force you to be referred to some other department so that you have to pay for it they have to do it i mean look you you got health care good for you if i'm seriously injured I'm going to the fucking emergency room. Screw insurance. I'm not going to be forced to pay for something that is a charitable benefit. And if you do, you're a fool. Because again, it's the number one cause of death, the number one cause of bankruptcy in the country. Medical bills. What are medical bills? Well, they're assigned to persons, not men. Now you can call me, you can, you can lump me into this group of people who actually need charitable help. And you can call me any name you want, but you're forgetting one thing. Charity is the highest law. Charity is the highest law. You're forgetting love. You're forgetting forgiveness. You're forgetting all the laws of God. You are acting completely irrationally. You're acting as a brainwashed fool in the legal realm. You're judging people, and therefore you shall be judged. You see, this is our great failure. We actually look down upon people who need charity when we should be looking up because we are there to serve, not to rule, not to judge, not to be better or worse. These are all titles. These are all flatteries. They're not real. Over the last 10 years, the most frequent violations by hospitals was the failure to do an adequate medical screening exam. You know how they treat you when you go into a hospital. It's horrible unless you're saying, hey, you can extort me because I have insurance or I'm a person. They can't actually do that, though. You see, thus, we're talking about all the complaints that the, the, we just read the law. They cannot do that. And it's up to you to have this knowledge, to quote this law when you go in and film it. Tell them you're filming. Tell them you're going to take them to court if they don't treat you or your, your family, your, your, your loved ones. Or hell, even the you see a bum on the street, what, someone you call a bum, someone that's disenfranchised. Why aren't you taking them to the hospital to get treated? Oh, well, they're, they're scum, right? They're, they're, they're beneath you. Well, go back to show zero and look at that pyramid again. Look at that pyramid because you're really high on that fucking pyramid that says, I'm better, I'm a higher class. Even though you're the lowest class in the United States, you're the highest class when it comes to everyone else. Because you're the one 
that's being bad to these people. You're the one that's wealthy compared to them. You're the one breaking all the laws of God when it comes to them. Again, I'm just telling you the truth. You can take it or leave it. You can attack the messenger if you want. Again, I'm used to it. But what you can't do is deny the self-evidence of what I'm saying. Uh, I, I listed the relevant uh, <laughs> complaints here. Number one, or number two, to stabilize patients who have emergency medical conditions. That's the first thing they're supposed to do. They don't ask you your name. They don't ask you your insurance. They are required to immediately stabilize you. That's their job. That is why they have a hospital, because they're an Elisa Minori or charitable organization. Failure to offer stabilizing treatment was the fourth most common EMTALA violation over the last 10 years. A violation of the law, not a suggestion, the law, right? The problem is you guys don't know the law. <laughs> And if you don't know, ignorance, of course, is no excuse, right? If a hospital can't stabilize a patient, it is required to arrange an appropriate transfer to another facility, including treatment to lessen the risks of, tra of transfer, getting consent from the receiving hospital to accept the transfer because it's charity, ensuring the transfer involves qualified personnel and transportation, an ambulance, for instance, now, keep in mind, there are certain doctors out there that get real serious privileges in these hospitals. In order to get those privileges, they're required to do charity care, non-profit or pro bono care. Go ask. Go ask around, especially doctors that are extremely wealthy. In order for them to do what they do, to have these privileges, and to go from hospital to hospital to do surgery, they are required. I know this firsthand. They are required to do charity care in a certain degree, certain amount. Otherwise, the hospital couldn't exist. Failure to do an appropriate transfer was the second most common way hospitals have violated this law over the last 10 years. In other words, they trick you into being transferred into something that is non-charitable. You can't afford it and you say, I don't want to go. You're screwed. Because they don't tell you what your rights are, what the law says. Number four here, to keep appropriate records on patients, including a central log of who came to the ER and what happened to them, failure to keep this log was the third most common violation over the last 10 years. You've seen it on TV. These hospitals will literally dump patients in the street. They'll even drive them away from the hospital because they don't want to pay for their care. And trust me when I say what they pay for care and what you pay are two different things. Their cotton balls, which are $2 for you, are two cents for them. And we haven't even gotten to the good part because, hey, they're getting reimbursed for this. <laughs> they're trying to... Oh, it's just disgusting. So This is disgusting. They don't post signs in the ER letting people know about these rights. That is a complaint. They don't keep a list of on-call doctors who can see patients in case of emergency. Remember, an emergency, what is an emergency? It's, 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 it's got the same power as war, right? Declaration of emergency, emergency powers of presidents, right? That means necessity. That means necessity knows no law. They have to see you. It's a charitable act. And that's why these on-call doctors and certain doctors with certain privileges have to have pro bono work in their portfolio. They're still making millions of dollars. Don't feel sorry for them. They're required to be Elisa Minori, that is charitable operators. Don't feel sorry for them. Don't give them anything in the way of sympathy. If they weren't required to do it, there would be no charity because these guys are assholes for the most part. You've heard of be called gods before. I've never met a good doctor. I've never had a fucking good doctor in my life. I've had such bad experiences. If there is a good doctor, I certainly don't know about it. And in my upcoming documentary, I'm going to reveal to you the truth. The truth, none of them take an oath. There is no such thing as an oath. They'll tell you they're blue in the face that they take an oath. It's a lie. There is no requirement to take any oath. And guess what? An oath is always to God, even a legal oath. 
It's actually against God. But the point is, it's always to God. God is always involved. How many doctors are <laughs> God-faring? Well, no, they're profit-driven. <sighs> Another complaint is the acceptance of appropriate transfers from other hospitals if the receiving facility has special abilities or is able to care for an incoming patient. In other words, they don't want to do charity. And you'll say, well, I don't blame them, those, those, those horrible people who have no money and have no other outlet. Well, you know, that means you're the sick one, not them. That means these hospitals are breaking the freaking law. Not just the spiritual law, but actually the legal law. So how's that? Number eight complaint. <laughs> Not being punished. In other words, a hospital employee who reports a violation is being punished. So an employee who actually understands this and who says, yes, we'll take you as pro bono. Instead of trying to extort you and make yourself the informer, make yourself give information, right, that, that makes you uh, exactable, extortable, they get reported, they get in trouble, they get fired. That was another complaint that hospital employees are actually getting punished, fired, whatever, for reporting a violation by the very hospital that's breaking the law. Another complaint for these hospitals to actually report any improperly transported patients it receives within 72 hours. That's the law. They're not doing it. Right? Remember, that's three days. What's three days? Well, remember, that's the lemon law. <laughs> There's a lot of things that have to do with three days. There's a reason that three days was used for Christ's death and resurrection. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't just, it could have been five days, could have been seven days, could have been one day, but no, it was three days. Why? Well, the same reason that's used in law. Bottom line, yes, illegal immigrants, as you have been indoctrinated to call the imaginary legal persons of men from other the municipal corporations and nations, get better, free, guaranteed, by law, health care than your own legal personhood to the United States allows for. Better than having insurance, I'd say. But you must act like a man, not a person. You must demand that the hospital act morally, charitably, and even legally uh, follow the law as its charter requires. It's a lisa minori, if I'm saying that right, charter. But instead, most of us stand clueless and accept financial responsibility to that which is required by law to be free. That is charity. Despite the fact that they are reimbursed for their free treatment of the indigent and poor. Okay, so don't complain about these people. Don't complain about paying a very minute amount of tax to, to this so-called charitable endeavor, you bastards. Because that, again, puts you right upon the middle of the pyramid. Not at the bottom, but the middle of the pyramid. And everybody else is under you. You're the bad guys. You're part of the order. The system. You're the bad guy. These corrupt hospitals thrive on tricking you, a generally ignorant subject and ward of government that you are, to pay for your own health care. This is like a slave owner requiring his slaves to pay for room, board, and medical care. The only difference is that you are a voluntary debt slave and therefore can be tricked. It's your right to be tricked and extorted into paying for what is supposed to be a charitable functionality of the government. That is what governments are formed for, people. They're not formed to keep you an asshole, to keep you stringently greedy and wealthy. That's not what they're for, man. Charity is the highest of moral laws, but charity is at the same time the death of commerce. Think about that for a moment. There's no commerce if you're acting charitably at all times. It's impossible. There's no money. Charity is the death of commerce, of misuse, of legality loopholes, and of man's incessant desire for gain. How do you gain if you're charitable? Truly charitable, not a corporation calling itself a charity, a false name, a false title that you respect. No, true charity. Now, anyone that argues against these facts is not arguing against opinion, but against law. 
Seriously. These hospitals, that is the ones with emergency rooms, are specifically chartered as, I knew I was saying that right, are specifically chartered as a limacenary in construction. Meaning, we define the term, and by the way, all these, most of these definitions are straight out of Webster's 1828. I just decided to use one dictionary this time. Elisa Minori, a limacenary, sorry, uh, alms, to pity, compassion. Oh my God, that's horrible. Given in charity, given or appropriated to support the poor as a limacenary, rents or taxes relating to charitable donations intended for the distribution of alms or for the use of management of donations, i.e. taxes, whether for the subsistence of the poor or for the support of promotion and learning as an alimacenary corporation. A hospital founded by charity is an alimacenary institution for the support of the poor, sick and impotent. What is a hospital? What is a hospital supposed to be? Imagine if, like, remember the show MASH? Or, or just think of that. What if the, the military tried to charge its soldiers for having to come in to the field hospital because his arm got blown off. That's how ridiculous this is. Hospitals are, without exception, founded to be charities. Institutions for the support of the poor, sick, and impotent. Also, a college, and a lot of time hospitals are in colleges, right? They're founded, universities, they're founded by donations. So a college founded by donations is an alimacenary institution for the promotion of learning. The corporation entrusted with the care of such institutions is a alimacenary. One who subsists on charity. Now, again, you might ask, because you haven't been listening, how is it that hospitals make so much money? How, why do they charge so much? Because... Charity only exists in reality. Persons aren't real. If you say you're a person, you're going to get charged. Remember, men cannot be charged except by God, except by moral issues, or, if you will, by the devil <laughs> when he takes contract. Okay? Men of God subsist on charity. Now, you're trained to think, well, no, only poor people. Well, yeah, guess what? If I'm subsisting on charity, that means, and, and I'm a man of God, that means I've given up mammon, money. I don't subsist on money, I subsist on charity. And that means I'm giving charity at all times and therefore expect it back. It's the way the world should be. Now, again... <laughs> That's a self-evident truth. That is called the law of God. No one can deny this. And it is, in fact, again, why it is part of this quote-unquote system, this legal realm, and why they passed this law. Why did they have to pass this as a legal law? Because you people are not following God's law. It's simple as that. Make no mistake, these hospitals were formed for charitable purposes. However, these men also sought to abuse that public privilege for the purpose of profit and gain. They are not men of God, but rather philanthropists, humanists, the worst kind of hypocrites. In other words, they don't operate under the law of God. In fact, they don't believe in that sort of thing. They believe that all good comes from men. That anything that, that's going to happen that's good is going to come from man, that there's no intervention of God, don't need God, etc., etc., etc. And that can only lead to confusion. Once commercial considerations are put into place, no charity can overcome the power of mammon and its legal code, especially a corporation bound under a corrupt governmental structure as is in place today. Of course, we know that congressmen are pretty much the the whores, the prostitutes for these companies, pharmaceutical companies, medical companies, hospitals, etc. Even you who may be reading this right now are probably suffering from cognitive dissonance, right? Generally accusing all who seek healing as a charitable act as scoundrels, bastards, 
moochers or some other devilish epitaph you've been trained to bestow upon anyone that needs love, charity, support, or any other tenet of God's law. That is the legal mindset, after all. They are not the fools. You are. For you have been deceived wholeheartedly into acting in a life of anti-Christ, anti-charity, anti-love, unnatural legal fiction under mammon. A character born of man's darkest fictional fold. You have become even worse than that which is above you in status. What are you? You're like a house slave, demonizing those beneath even your own lower class. But you're not the lowest, right? We think we've established that. And your desperate placement upon the pyramid of power status and control, dishing out false judgment and hatred for those you are in truth supposed to be caring for, whether they're above you or below you, according to the word, that is. Instead, you've entrusted the legal lie that is Elim Sonori Corporations. You believe that charities will do your work, is what that means. You believe that by giving money to some charity, you're helping people, but you're not. That's hypocrisy. You're not helping anybody because charity is an action. Okay? It's not just a name. It's not just a flattering title. Charity is something you do. Right? Giving money is not charity. It's humanism. It's mammon. Now, I'm going to put some YouTube videos into this presentation today. Some of them are uh, so-called copyrighted. And I would claim that I'm doing this as fair use, uh, which of course is again the law that YouTube seems to ignore. And I'm doing so for educational purposes, for critique purposes, uh, all purposes except to make a profit. Everybody knows by now I'm not in this for profit. There is no profit to be made from this. There is no way I can violate the law. I am simply using these things, claiming them under fair use. Will that matter? Well, we'll see. However, this particular one that shows in the blog is the one I played on the first show. And a lot of you didn't like it, because as I say here, you might not be able to handle these deep truths. You are the demi-oppressor that needs an alibi. If you don't remember, if you didn't see this, watch the first show, which was actually show zero of season two. What's in this video, if you listen, and you, you know, I don't like rap either, but hey, th this guy's doing brilliant work here. Listen to it. Give it the respect it deserves. The reason you don't like it is because it's talking about you. It's saying you are the demi-oppressor. You are the one oppressing everyone else because of your so-called status. Now, I'm sorry you don't like that. I'm not going to play it again, but... Just so you know, it's here if you want to watch it again. Or you can go to the first show and watch the important part. Again, I digress. <laughs> now, before you get all bent out of shape and attempt to fallaciously kill the messenger here, and, you know, again, I invite you to do a little true science of your own. If you somehow believe me to be wrong, then I invite you to go out into the wilderness, into the ocean, into the meadows, anywhere you like that is untouched by man, and I want you to find the number two. Or the letter A. Or the equation E equals MC squared. Go ahead, I'll wait. Waiting. Well, what's the matter? You couldn't find it? Numbers, letters, symbols, and signs are idols. They should never be considered as anything else. They are fiction. They are art. All of them. Even the ones that are so seemingly correct. The ones that can't be disproven, if you will. None of them are real. They are part of the description of the design, not the design. The art in most cave drawings, for instance, carries no meaning to the modern arts, and for good reason. They were never real in the first place. Trying to figure out another tribe's language as compared to one's own is like trying to compare a Bob Ross painting or the Salvador Dali. Both are art, and so no referential to the real can be actually conferred, though good old Bob certainly made some happy little trees. Now I want you to look at these, 
these are uh, Salvador Dali paintings. And while they're cool and all, do they bring you <laughs> good thoughts of warmth and charity to your heart? Do they make you feel good? Because comparing Ross and Dolly is like comparing National Geographic to a Western ink plot test. Now, inversely, let's look at Bob Ross and what he did, what the true form of art is. And, you know, think about it this way. What you paint is what you see. I can't imagine seeing the world through Dolly's eyes. Like I said, it's cool, man. I love the strangeness of Dolly, but I don't respect it. I don't give it substance. I don't let it affect my reality, my view, my understanding. And yet I can look at a Bob Ross painting and I can say, ah, wow, that is a beautiful, beautiful description that is a beautiful view of nature you have there man's greatest folly is the love that is belief and worship the idolization of his own artificial measurements over any truth any part of nature that is actually being measured to worship the artful measurement of what is already self-existent that is existing without man's invention in nature is to worship the idol the empty form of the actuality to cause the real to be devolved into an art form, thus causing a false sense of arrogant correctness in that which is not of self-evidence. Now, you don't see arrogance in Bob Ross. Bob Ross wasn't trying to redefine nature. He wasn't trying to uh, uh, make it abstract or do something that didn't give him the feeling of love. He was sincere in his art. And I can look at his art and I can appreciate what it is that he was painting, which is an appreciation, a love for nature as it stands, not wanting to change it, not wanting to hate it, or any, just absolute appreciation for truth. That to me is true art or the art of truth. Art reinvents truth. Truth is never art, never artificial. This, above all else, is the law of nature and the law of God, right? It's why it's against persons and flattering titles and fictions and legal law and everything else, because God is truth, right? Everything that is Jehovah is truth. Nothing that is false or a lie or artifice is Jehovah, is truth. We are to have no other gods, no other false truths before the self-evidence of self-existent truth. This is the law, the highest commandment. Whether the art be of religious origin or of secular means, art is never truth. Art is never of God. God is truth. Art is never truth. If there is one thing we must all understand to be free, it is this. We cannot think of God, of Jehovah, as anything but what is truth. To do otherwise is to enter into idolatry of artificial things, making what is false real or appearing real. A child, for instance, may certainly play connect the dots and pretend to see the empty form of an elephant therein. But at least the child dreams of the real in all its living essence when he does so. In other words, the belief that order is created through geometry or other mathematical symbols created by man is idolatry. You might call it science, but it's still idolatry. Likewise, to believe the word of God is actually made of the words of men is an equal, really idiotic idolatry. <laughs> in the beginning... That statement, I assure you, was not the symbol of a word, right? In the, in the beginning, there was the word. It's, I assure you, that was not the symbol of a word. It wasn't a word that floated across the sky or whatever. But words came after man came to be. They, they exist because of man, not because of God. And they certainly didn't exist before man. The word man was not created before man existed. And the word of God... The capitalized word, which is W-O-R-D, meaning law, 
is not made of words. Man did not create the word of God. The word of God is truth, self-existent, self-evident. That is not what man creates or invents. Words are the art of forming truth. They are not the substance of truth. They are the form. The word of God is the logos, the law of the whole of self-existence. That is Jehovah. And also called as that which we know and are governed by helplessly the law of nature. Despite how we try and disobey it and overcome it, it's always going to be there. It's going to let us live or cause us to die, depending on how we treat it and whether or not we obey it. The law of truth is the law of God. This ordered convenience and escapism through symbol worship, like viewing any abstraction of reality, releases man's mind and spirit from the discomforts and pains of bearing any kind of moral compass. In other words, if I think that what I'm doing is legal and yet it's against the law of God, I can just dismiss my moral compass and do it anyway. I can act against God because that's what the legal law tells me to do. In fact, sometimes it forces me to do it. As the subject of man's wholly limited observational and artful sciences, the nature of reality and therefore man's unique self-responsibility and duty to it are being continuously devolved into some vague quantum remainder. Just as the thrown away cuttings of a chef are an undesired fodder mashed into food for beasts and pets, the trappings of counterculture are also consumed without understanding by the illiterate masses of human livestock. Moral judgment has become a mere chattel plaything, a commodity, no longer a commandment of God, but a property of man's delusion of its own godliness a falsely ordained control over the natural order and its law. We believe we can just throw it away like all that extra food. But such self-delusion and remittance of self-responsibility comes with an extremely heavy price. We're seeing that today, manifesting in modern times with a quickening unprecedented and therefore unpredictable. The only certainty is that nature and its law must overcome the burden that man has become. For the only alternative is its own death. In nature, however, there is one quite self-evident maxim proven by time immemorial throughout man's physical anthropological history, as he calls it, that which is caused or created by man is always temporary in nature. This is a self-evident truth because what man creates is never part of truth never in harmony with Jehovah. Now, let us query our own mediocre search for truth. On your journey through the natural order as unfettered by man, did you find anything out there resembling art? Or did the essential truth of nature steal the show? Did you find the number two? Did you find E equals M squared? Did you find anything that man has created to represent truth out there in the truth, in nature? No. Did you see the living world of nature with eyes that see? Or did you contemplate it all with dead numbers, symbols, and equations because you still feel the addiction toward the artful artificial proofs invented by man to explain the already self-evident existence of creation, of that which is self-existent, of that which is beyond the control or orders of men? Have you found any proof that the order of nature requires in any way the fictional order and orders of men? Do you still believe that somehow the nature of the universe and its law actually depends upon anything man-made to exist? Do you think it depends on you, your beliefs, anything that emanates from you? Or have you lost that ego? Maybe you think the universe is a corporation run by God. Because man is not the creator of truth, man foolishly considers all creation, that is self-evident truth, as chaotic because the laws of nature do not conform or tolerate to the artful logics, false laws, and inventions of man. What is of man is like rust on metal. At first, merely a surface irritation, but when left to its corrosive nature, spreads like a cancer until it actually interferes with the natural order and law. 
Metal is a wonderful example, actually, since metal rods and bars are not self-existent. They don't pull railroad tracks, ties, and rods from the earth, of course. Nor are nails pre-divined, that is, designed or pickable from trees. Metal is a resource. Meaning, that which is of source, that which is of God, Jehovah, repurposed by man for his own wants and desires. In opposition, that is antagonism to nature and its design, used for the inventions and construction over source in redesign of creation. Self-existent truth, we're talking asphalt jungles, parking lots, even gardens. How about agriculture? Nothing natural about that. And as we see with the nation's failing infrastructure and tens of thousands of bridges on the repair list, listed already as past the failing grade, with some already collapsed on their own. It's a known entity that what is man-made is always, without exception, temporary in its nature, because it's not part and parcel with nature. It is not in unity. Metal, why it's such a good example, is because just like men, it turns to dust and falls back into the earth. What defines temporariness? The simple and obvious fact that what is an invention of man cannot reproduce itself. Art is always temporary and has no ability in and of itself to adapt to the ordered change that is nature's design. Now, I should caveat that by saying that artificial intelligence may very well start recreating itself, but it's not creating. It's constructing. It is not creation. It is artificial and therefore it is not of God. It is not part of creation and it cannot create any more than man can create. What is not of source cannot therefore create source or what is self-existent, self-evident. Art may clone itself as technology is more and more self-guiding, but a clone is also not creation, not new. Art, that is artifice, in any form simply cannot exist without man's care and maintenance of it, lest it perish under the extreme pressure of nature's laws. What is temporary cannot be preserved for eternity, for only what is of self-existence is eternal. Now this gets a little confusing for people. The notion of eternal is not one of time. What? Remember, time is a construct of man. We're not talking about eternity as a timeline because there is no timeline. It's eternal. It's without time. That is the way you're supposed to live, without time, without these so-called legal events in the space between. You see, that is what a true man of God is. Now, one of my favorite quotes by... Shuang Tzu, I don't know if I'm saying that right, thought to have existed in the 3rd or 4th century BC, it gives us the best understanding of what I've come across, anyway, about what the true men or sons of God would actually be. And it's interesting because if, if they make no history, which is the last sentence he says, there would be no record of them, and if we were alive today as, as sons of God and having nothing to do with this legal system, there would also be no history made of us. That's very interesting, right? Because we're not we're not part of the timeline. We're not part of we're not we're doing nothing that is an event that, that can be recorded. We have no names, right? It's uh, it's amazing when you think about this. But here's what he says: trying to describe this sort of a perfectly harmonious and morally spiritually run society of men. No one paid any special attention to worthy men, nor did they single out the man of ability. Rulers were simply the highest branches on a tree and the people were like deer in the woods. They were honest and righteous without realizing that they were doing their duty. They loved each other and did not know that this was love of neighbor. They deceived no one, yet they did not know that they were men to be trusted. They were reliable and did not know this was good faith. 
So they didn't need contracts. They lived freely together, giving and taking, and did not know that they were generous. For this reason, their deeds have not been narrated. They made no history. Right? Because what is there to record? Nature? I mean, this is truly a description of men acting according to the law and laws of nature. Therefore, there's nothing to record in man's history because man's history is always something that happens against nature, against all that is normal, if you will, all that is self-existent and self-evident. These people, they made no splash. They did nothing to warrant, say, a war or anything negative in that capacity. They, they didn't do anything to make history. And this really is what you should strive for. Right here, this is a description of what the Bible instructs us to be. Right here. Do you need credit? If you, if you cure cancer, do you really need to have credit for it? To have your name, this fictional thing, right? Do you need to get money for it, to copyright it so that no one can actually use what you... Do you need to do all these things? Do you need to protect something that you did so that no one else can use it? Or are you doing it because you want to cure cancer? Right? I mean, wouldn't that be the purpose of doing it? And sure, you know, people think that's great, but why do you deserve work, any attention except for doing what, for all intents and purposes, you're intended to do, right? I mean, you're not doing anything special. Think about it. You're just being a good man, a man of God, and there, under no circumstances would a man of God withhold something good from other men. And yet that's what our whole system is based on. That's what the legal system is based on. None of this makes sense when you think about it. None of this makes, it doesn't make sense why we are trapped in this matrix. It doesn't make sense. It is so far removed and against, opposed to the law of nature that we're not even recognizable as men anymore. No, we're recognized as persons. It's pathetic. They made no history. <laughs> Think about what that means. They had no false identity. They didn't feel the need to be accredited for their good works and so they felt no need to have their name listed for any event on any false time or space line. Right? They, they knew Nothing but their own self, their own true self, and the true self of others. They didn't confuse anyone with some name or title. They gave credit to no one, and they gave debt to no one. Because without titles or artful legal statuses, we're all just men and we're equal. They kept only the self-evident law of nature. It's beautiful. And I know that people out there like you who have and can see with eyes and have ears to hear and understand what I'm saying and what I'm saying is just really what the Bible says. Come on, folks. I know you want to live in this state. I know you want to be like that description, right, that we just read. How do we do it? Well, We've already violated all the laws. We've already become, for all intents and purposes, exactly what we are not supposed to be. So we're already so far removed from this that now we have to understand, we have to have the knowledge, and we have to take action to get out of this system and become sons of God, as they say, as the Bible says. Follow the word, right? Be Christ-like. That's the only thing we can do. But to do that... We cannot be under this system. Now, I know that a lot of you people, because you've written me personally, you've expressed the same frustration as I have, that I know that you want to be a part of something beautiful like this. I know that most of you do. And I also know that, like me, most of you are addicted to the legal system, to money. Uh, you have to have it to eat. And, you know, that's our, our opinion anyway. I understand. It's an addiction. 
we think we need a drug. We think we need heroin when we're addicted, right? It's the same thing. You don't actually need it, but you feel like you do. Because you see, it's not part of nature. So you can't say it's something you need. God provides, right? Everything you need is in nature. But this is the war, isn't it? This is the war that I keep speaking of. And we keep ignoring. And that's why we're losing the war. Because it's one-sided. The attacks are all coming at us, not from us. The war on nature, and that includes us. We're part of nature. But we're not acting like it, and therefore we can be abused and misused and absolutely destroyed by our lack of knowledge. By our not only knowledge, but lack of knowledge of how to fight this. Well, I hate to tell you, but you, as a legal person, you can't fight it. That's the point. They've got you by the balls. They've got your hands tied. The only way you can fight it is to not be a part of it. But you're born into it. I was born into this. I didn't have a choice. You always have a choice. That's the point. When you don't have a choice is when you're part of the system. But if you choose to leave the system, which is really your only choice, well, then you're no longer bound by its law and you can fight it. And what are you fighting? Fiction. You don't have to kill any man. You don't have to destroy anything real. This is a war against principalities, fictions, creations, inventions, I should say, of man. You don't have to harm any man. But you do have to stop respecting what man creates. The perceived life and death cycle of existence is not a sign of mortality, but of the eternal. Not surprisingly, this word eternal is one of the names or appellations of God, that is Jehovah. That which is eternal, or if you will, immortal, is that which is of God, of nature, of self-existence. Life continues uninterrupted, dust to dust, blood to blood, microbe to microbe, right? I'm not saying that every man has some permanent uh, place in... Yeah, you know, there's a big difference between the word as a spiritual concept and the word as these idiot freaking transhumanists that want to put their brains or their, their somehow their, their substance into a computer, right? Big difference here. Not talking about that kind of view of the immortal. What is immortal is that which is not acting mortally. By acting eternally is to act godlike, to act Christ-like. It doesn't mean you're not going to die. It's a concept. It's a spiritual state of being. It's not what these fools consider as prolonged life or, you know, eternal life. That's not what it's meant to mean. Again, they've tricked you with words. Only the selfishness of man may disrupt the natural design and order of life. Selfishness here meaning the delusion that man can exist separate and without the care of nature and its law. Well, part of that is death. I'm sorry. Of that, which both causes and supports life, well, death supports life, right? It's not like you can continue living after you're eaten. Your vegetables go in you and they have the force of life and that supports life, but the vegetables no longer living. So death supports life. That is what causes life to carry on eternally. Life is not a tangible construct. Life is passed on in continuity and perpetuity. That's the whole idea of being born <laughs> than having children. That is unless man's foolish artful practices get in the way. No words, no math, no equations, and no symbolic reference can possibly decipher the divine creation, the self-existence of that which is the mystery of the eternal Jehovah. Now that you've traveled the world in purposeful witness of only the substance of nature as created, that is designed, and have certainly found its order, its natural order to be self-existent and eternal, that is not man-made, not numerical, not lettered or written, not symbolic, not artificial. Now that you've cracked open a dozen coconuts and found no words or numbers inside the harvest, and now that you've scoured the lakes, rivers, and streams of the rainforest in search of an H or a 2 or an O, 
and come up physically and substantively short, we can now perhaps start to understand that nature is the exact opposite of chaos. The only confusion or contradiction that happens in nature is generally that which is reflective of what follows when man attempts to act outside of and interfere in the natural order and law of its eternal, unchanging design. Now there's another word, unchanging. Does that mean that it never changes? Of course not. It's talking about logos, the law. It's not talking about people or plants or climates or anything like that. That's not what unchanging means. It means it can't be changed by man, is what it means. It means anything you do is going to be defeated eventually by nature and probably means you're going to be defeated along with it since you're the source of chaos, the source of anti Law and anti-nature, anti-Christ. It's not nature that is unchanging, but it's law. The law is the word of God that is the logo. So, let's define chaos. That confusion or confused mass in which matter is supposed to have existed before it was separated into its different kinds and reduced to order by the creating power of God. So here we see that God, creation, in other words, is the opposite of chaos, that chaos is what was before creation. Now, again, let's not take this as science, all right? (laughs) This was in 1828, and it is the best understanding that people had. But it's also very relevant to understanding the concept of chaos, the concept that When man talks about evolution, he's talking about the unfolding or the undesigning of the natural order. So any mixed mass without due form or order as a chaos of materials, well, obviously the uniform is not without due form or order. It's not a chaos of materials. If it were, we'd have no way to track time. Why do I say that? Because once you leave Earth, folks... You're not at any fixed reference point, so there is no time. You can't look at a planet or something and say, okay, that means the time. You can't look at the sun and say, every 24 hours it's in this spot of the sky, etc. You cannot measure time in space. That's the whole point. There is no time in space. There is no sunrise. There is no sunset. Because you're in the middle of what we call space. Right? (laughs) There's no time. Confusion, disorder, a state in which the parts are undistinguished. Okay, well that doesn't describe nature in any way, shape, or form. Isaiah 45, 16 and number 20 says, They shall be ashamed and also confounded, that is, confused, in chaos. All of them, they shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. Well, that's the state and that's the church. That's persons. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Wow, is that not the perfect description? We're all stuck in the nations, in the the legal matrix of nations, which is about to be put into a central government called United Nations, just like the states were put into a central government called United States. We have no knowledge that the wood... That is the cross of this graven image we worship instead of Jehovah. And we pray to a God that cannot save because we don't know even the name of God as we discussed in the last show. And if you didn't see the last show, you might not understand what I'm saying. Pray unto a God that cannot save. Yeah, because you're praying to a creation of man. You're not praying to that which creates man. You're praying to some image that was created by man. That's a big difference, right? 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Right? Well, that can only mean one thing. That man 
is the creation of confusion, the author of confusion. Almost everyone I talk to on a personal level has the same chaotic fascination with reality, with nature, which is that they are downright afraid of it. Their own nature has become unknown to them, an unknown God, an unknown source. We have been entrained, brainwashed, and enculturated to believe that we cannot exist without the artificial order of man's law, of money, of credit, of debt, of titles, of names, and all these legal things. We've been fooled into thinking that nature and its law equals chaos, that is disorder, when nothing could be farther from the truth. God, that is Jehovah, is the only truth. Nature and its law is truth. And truth will set you free. What is man-made is never truth. Though man's lies and fictions are often called as facts, and we confuse facts and call them truths, <laughs> legal truths, which is an oxymoron, as if a legally established man-made fact is the same as a naturally occurring, that is, self-existent, self-evident truth. That which is not man-made. Yet this fact-based system of word terms is the very foundation of all man-made law. From legalism to the various arts called as sciences, words being merely empty form without actual essence or substance. Distinguishing between reality, what is of the essence of Jehovah, and artifice, what is formed by man, is the absolute cornerstone of understanding everything biblical. Everything real, everything of the law of nature, or at least supposed to be. But the devils have gotten in our way, the attorneys and the men who practice religion uh, as false gods, false Christs, like the Pope and the Queens. We, however, are a civilization, an incorporation based on lies, that is, fictions. Yet, the same fallacious argument could be made that much or most of the Bible is as well fiction. I completely understand that fallacious point of view. This would not be incorrect, of course, uh, but there is one major difference, one of intent and of virtue. Yeah, the Bible is a moral story, a compass, if you will, directing men toward the path of a righteous life. But these stories, these allegories of great wisdom and creed are still obviously fictional and metaphoric in nature. Well, obvious to <laughs> anyone with reason. Uh, so why are they different than that of the legal fiction? And by legal fiction, I mean the story of nations, the story of America, the founding fathers, etc. Put simply, the Bible is designed to make men free by their own actions, while the legal system is designed to cause men to become ensnared and trapped, and thus enslaved by debt instruments and through the bond and surety of personhood. All right, big difference. While the Bible teaches to deny respect towards persons in every way without exception, the legal system cannot operate without men agreeing to personhood. So yes, while both are fictions, one leads to truth and the other leads to and requires anti-truth. They are non-convergent paths that lead to completely separate states of being. They are oil and water, and while oil stains and burns... Only the water bestows the purity of clean hands. So, in the end, it's a choice between purity or surety, freedom or slavery. The man that walks on water, that is, walks over the law of the sea of commerce, as Jesus did, without sinking in debt, as Jesus allegorically did, remains in purity free from legal stains. His soul, his spirit, is undefeated by the fictions of men, untainted by the false law of false legal gods. Now again, we're going to get to what the spirit or the soul actually is, which is completely different than what the church ever will tell you. Lies are always at the center of fear, and fear is always at the center of obedience. This is universal, applying to all realms. Rulers, that is, men in flattering title, the titles that we respect and therefore they gain this sort of false existence that we fear, you know, that's belief. Belief means you love something or you fear something and there's really, or hate something. And there's really a very slight difference between love and hate, as we know. <laughs> the, the notion of loving and hating is belief and therefore... This word love, which in other words means that, again, you 
you actually are giving something power or giving something an artificial sense of substance because either you love it or hate it. The more you hate Donald Trump, the more power you give him, the more respect you're actually giving the existence of the office itself. The man is is almost irrelevant as to the the uh, belief system or the power that's given to the office itself, this fictional character that we say is our president or more importantly as agents it's our principal in government rulers again they rule by fear alone just as the fear of god jehovah is what should cause men to follow the law of nature logos you know personified as the story of christ follow that example don't worship it as an idol this beautiful fear of God, fear of Jehovah is defined biblically and described fully in my book. Uh, in other words, the the word fear is another one that's sort of misunderstood. Um, is not the fear of some anthropomorphized figure in the sky as a deity or idol of God with a lightning bolt in hand that's going to strike you down if you do something wrong. Not that kind of fear. Those are the kind of fears we actually have of <laughs> presidents and dictators. We give them that kind of respect and power. No, no, the type of fear we're talking about is the type of fear, you know, if we choose the chaos of organized, lawless legalism over the self-evident order of nature's design. In other words, we do something against God's law, we should accept or expect something bad to happen to us. We're not fearing the law and therefore, you know, the law wins in the end. That natural order is always going to win in the end. It's very important to understand that. Again, because everything man does is temporary, God will always overcome. And he or she that is part of God and of the origin of God and not of the state will overcome. So in other words, Instead of fearing Jehovah, instead of fearing God, the correct, beautiful, loving kind of fear that says, hey, I'm going to be obedient, I'm going to obey your law, and therefore never have any of these problems or diseases or things that, that are caused by man, we fear to be without man's law, without the ordered chaos of the commercial law of nations, law of nations, and, and, and legalist, money-driven nonsense, mammon. We can't imagine life without money. In other words, you can't examine existence without non-existence. You can't imagine reality without the imaginary, <laughs> without the fiction, which is so strange when you think about it. And it's, of course, against uh, God's law. It's not fearing God when you fear fiction instead of God. You know, that's... <laughs> The consequences of having fear of fiction is our own enslavement that we're seeing. It's exactly what we're all suffering from today is this fear of nonsense. Fear of, when I say nonsense, I mean something that's not sensual, something that's not spiritual, something that's artificial. Money, that is mammon, or the valuation of money, is that which does not exist or have spiritual value in nature is at the heart of organized chaos, which is why the Latin or legal word for order is printed upon every commercial bill of exchange. In other words, system is basically what they're saying. Every single dollar has the word order upon it in the Latin. The, in other words, the law Latin. The dollar as a single individual unit represents all other amounts of money reduced to order. We have chosen chaos, the law and order of man over God, the natural order and its law. That's very, very much against, of course, the law of God. Lies, of course, always and without exception, create or support chaos in the natural order and cause men to not only live chaotically, uh, but to accept in their minds what is unnatural. The laws of men that oppose the natural order, that is God's law, the law of nature, in favor of keeping the art of chaos in artificially ordered existence. In this way, it can be said that chaos is a science, uh, artificial science, right? A technological, artful science. The art of keeping order over artificially induced chaos 
this ordered chaos is the foundation of the governments of man, and these orders are without exception called corporations. That's interesting, isn't it? An order is a corporation, right? You incorporate to keep the order, uh, the principles over the agents, right? You ask, what is incorporation then? What is this damn word that we're talking about? Ah, not yet, not yet. We're going to get to that. But the simple answer is a corporation or incorporation is an order. What is an order? Now, this is a long one, but we're going to go through it. Regular disposition or methodical arrangement of things, a word of extensive application. In other words, it can be used in many ways. As we said, all words have multiple meanings. Order is the life of business. And good order is the foundation of all good things. <laughs> and notice they don't say good business because there's no such thing. Order is the life of business. I want you to think about that statement. Just like animation is the life of a cartoon. Well, you know that cartoons have no life. And we talked about the fact that a contract is said to have life when it's in effect between two points on a timeline, right? So what is the life of fiction, the life of business? Well, it's order. And that's why they want to establish this secular order and have. Proper state of things uses muskets as an example. The muskets are all in good order. Well, you know that if you, if you don't clean your gun, it's not going to be in good proper order. So these are pretty obvious. But this order is the life of business. You know, that's a very important order concept to understand because that's what's happening to us we're in a corporation and we are the agents of their commerce or business adherence to the point in discussion according to established rules of debate right so when you see these debates you you have certain rules that you follow instead of being free to speak and if you think about it that is what has happened that's what public school is for that's what learning this uh, dog Latin English, this this <laughs> this grammatical uh, Latin set on the English language. The reason they're teaching us that is because it's literally the language of illiteracy. And so not only are we illiterate in our words because we don't understand these various meanings, especially the legal or, or law Latin meaning, but we, we, we actually have an order in which we've been told we have to speak. Right? We're said to be politically incorrect, or we're stuck with all this <laughs> nonsense about being, um, you know, I can't say retarded, but I can say autistic. Well, autistic doesn't mean anything. It's not clearly defined, and it's not representative of something that happened to you. Oh, well, it's a dismissive word. In other words, I can look at a child and I say that child was retarded. That's an action. I can't say that child was autistic. No. See, that's why they want you to use it. But in their, in their literature, as I wrote about on my blog, they use the word retarded still as a professional word. All right, and you're 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 going in and saying, I think you caused autism. Oh no, vaccines don't cause autism. And you know what? That could be a true statement, but I'll tell you what they do cause because they say it in all of their studies. They cause retardation. But if you're not using the correct word and you're going to accuse someone of causing autism instead of retardation, which is what your child actually is, well, guess what? You're not going to get anything. You're not going to get any, any, you know, nothing's going to happen. You're using the wrong word. And we are trained to use either the wrong word or the incorrect word or non-legal use of the word, even though we're expected at all times to be legal entities, agents of the legal matrix. Order is the established mode of proceeding, regularity. Uh, the court is in order, for instance. So all of a sudden, there's this thing called court that magically appeared, where as before the room was empty and didn't have any people, it wasn't actually anything but then magically this order uh, called the legal jurisdiction and proceeding appears because we've appeared and we've said we are persons and therefore we've established order right but it's artificial every part of it is artificial it's the respect we give to it that makes it 
at least seem real and then have an effect on us because we're, again, not fearing God. We're taking artificial things and calling them real, giving them a value in mammon, which doesn't exist in nature. And it is that very lack of fear of Jehovah, of existence, of self-existence, of reality, in other words, of truth, the fear of truth, which is a good fear. It's a respect of fear, but instead we're giving respect to things that aren't true because we're afraid of the consequences of not doing so, which is patently ridiculous when you think about it, because then we're ignoring the truth at all costs, and the costs are great. So you start to see this word order compared to the natural order. Every aspect of order created by man is in fact controlled chaos because we remember nature chaos is never in nature so it's a creation of a different system or order that is opposed to the natural order in all cases and it's always temporary it might might last your whole lifetime but it's still temporary so established mode of proceeding regularity right what we say is normal for instance which is not normal at all settled mode of operation and he says this fact could not occur in the order of nature. It is against the natural order of things. Again, <laughs> there's no facts in nature and there's no man-made order or words or anything else. It's a mandate, a precept, a command, an authoritative direction. Well, think United Nations, think government. It's rules, regulations. It's the rules and orders of a legislative house. Well... Who's creating the order? <laughs> well, it's your government, folks. Regular government or discipline is order. Right? So you're talking about this new world order. Well, obviously, this is a secular government. If you, if you haven't figured that out, I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're way behind. It is necessary for society that good order should be observed. But, you see, that can be taken two ways. Yeah, you want like-minded people who follow the law of God, but this is talking about artificial order, too. So if you're a slave, you should be well-governed as a slave. Rank, class, division of men, that's an important one. That's why it's capitalized here. Rank, your class, the division of men. You know, those things are all very important. Why? Because remember what we said all men are created equal, created by God, under God equal. No status, no class, no rank, no division, not even by our skin color. We're just helpless little blobs of skin and water. That's it. I mean, that, that is what we, blood, skin, and water, that, that's what we're born as. There is no division. There is no rank. There is no class. There is no status. There is no person is the point. But we respect persons and therefore we are tricked into believing that that's just part of life. Just normal. It's the order of things. Well, no, it's not. It is not just the way it is. You have orders of priests. You have higher orders of society. And secret orders, secret societies. Men of the lowest order. Orders of knights, military orders, etc. A religious fraternity is an order. That's what corporations are. They're a division of natural objects, generally intermediate between class and genus. The classes in the Linnean artificial system are divided into orders, right? In other words, corporations, municipal corporations, municips. This is incredibly important, folks, to understand you're already in these new secular orders. It's just it's getting worse. It's getting more organized and refined to the point where, yeah, you're all going to be of lower class and you're all going to be in the same system and you're going to think you're equal in reality when, in fact, you're not because of this class structure, because of this order. You're not created equal. Or you're, at least you're pretending not to be. But it's all, again, because you're giving respect to these classes, to the person. And therefore, you're the lower class. <laughs> it's, it's pretty straightforward, really, when you understand it. A division of natural objects can also be 
an order or a system, if you will. But you see, there is no division of natural objects in nature. That's what man does. So we never would think of anything in nature as division. Because then it's not part of the whole. Then it's not acting according to the law of God. It's being used for some other purpose. Lin also arranged vegetables in his natural system into groups of genera called order. Now again, these are sciences. There is no genera in nature. This is a way of man to separate things, to divide things into groups. And it's not necessarily good or bad like we talked about last show. But it is always opposed or antagonistic to nature. Now, you have to understand that for what it is. It just means that it's an order or a system that is not something of reality. They're words, for God's sake. In the natural system of whatever that word is, the name, je sais, <laughs> orders are subdivisions of classes. And again, we can be talking about legal classes. We can talk about uh, animals and vegetables and minerals, right? Measures. We're measuring something. We're giving it a false value, in other words, right? Just like money, you can measure something and say it's this long or this wide or this, even though it's not real. We can say space is this big. Well, that doesn't mean anything because you have no experience. You have no actual knowledge, just the number. It's not real. In rhetoric, the placing of words and members in a sentence in such a manner as to contribute to the force and beauty of expression or to the clear illustration of a subject. Now, again, we're talking about our language skills, our ability to rhetoricize, and that's been severely, severely limited and severely, severely dumbed down because, of course... You know, you don't teach the slaves the language of their masters. It's, it's really simple. You don't teach those you wish to control the the Latin language, the law Latin. Uh, you, you teach them the dog Latin, the, <laughs> the four-footed beast language, right? The title of certain ancient books containing the divine office and matter of its performance. In orders set apart for the performance of divine service ordained to the work of the gospel ministry. In other words, corporate churches in order for the purpose to the end as a means to an end. Any order is set up as a means to an end. The question you should start asking is, what is the end? You know, what is the purpose of these orders? The best knowledge is that which is of the greatest use in order to our eternal happiness. Now again, this is godlike knowledge. In other words, divine knowledge that is truth, just truth, nothing else. It's not mysterious. It's not, you know, what is our eternal happiness? Eternal is not, oh, it's going to last to eternity. No, it's in the now, right here and now. It's eternal. It's unchanging, in other words. You can't take these words to mean what the psychopaths want you to think they mean when they're talking about their transhumanism. It's That's not what the word eternal is. General orders, the commands and notices which a military commander-in-chief issues to the troops under his command. As a verb, the word order means to regulate, to methodize, to systemize, to adjust, to subject to system and management and execution to order domestic affairs with prudence, to lead, to conduct, to subject to rules or laws. Well, which rules or laws? And obviously not the ones that are the foundation of law, not the Bible, not the law of nature. Those are self-evident, and we'd be following them if it weren't for all of this crap that man makes to replace it. To direct, to command, to manage, to treat, to ordain... Remember, the Constitution was ordained <laughs> to direct, to dispose of in any manner, to give command or directions. Now, the important statements here is that orders are subdivision of classes. Order is rank, class, division of men, not unity, but division, not 
equality, but something completely different. In order is to be managed, is to be subject to rules or laws, specifically in a system of management. Well, that's, <laughs> that's what government is. And execution, uh, which is, of course, the executive branch. Can Congress creates the laws and the executive branch, which includes the sheriff, ensures execution. These are fictional man-made secular orders built out of chaos, not the natural order of Jehovah. That is not what is governed by Logos, the law of nature. They don't exist in nature or under its law. They are purely an invention of man. We are kept in this state of incorporation, order, through various artificial orders. We are defined, classified, and ranked at birth, and therefore placed in the order of an artificially induced, assigned social class. But before they can cause order over the parts, the whole must be divided from itself, from its origin of source, again, God, Jehovah. Man as a unified order, the true church, in other words. Remember, church is not a building, it's not a corporation, it's men acting under the law like-minded men. So man is a unified order, mankind, as they say, under God must be chaotically incorporated from it. So you must be ripped out of the natural order and put into an artificial order, in other words. You must be classed and ranked. The body, or corpus in the Latin, must be divided and reshaped according to the orders of chaos, of rank, of class, of genus, etc. Now, you, you've been trained to think that class and genus are a way to create this so-called order. But again, anything that's plucked out of its natural habitat, anything that's plucked out of its natural state of being and then forced to follow a law that is against that natural state of being is therefore in chaos. So all of these ranks and classes and genuses are nothing more and nothing less than a way to organize the chaos that they're creating at all times. It's very important to understand this. In other words, each part, each individual man, must have his mind and body divided from his soul or spirit. For these parts in trinity, in, in union, constitute the whole man, the spiritually self-governing man, and together are the foundation of reasonable, lawful free will. Free will that is controlled, not chaotic, spiritually controlled. But how do you possibly have spirituality if your spirit is separated through incorporation into the legal system, through these false orders? You see, this is why it's so important to understand what the spirit actually is. To control any man, his spirit must be broken, his mind intentionally bent away from his spiritual existence, which causes his body to be detached from his spiritual moral compass. To control the masses of men, of illiterate men, of unspiritually guided men, we must all be spiritually torn asunder. Our spirit must be separated from our mind, in other words, so as to be placed into an artifice, a body corporate, an order, where all individual men are ordered into one hive body with one controlled hive mind and with one ordered hive anti-spirit. Patriotism is what they actually call it. Like a colony of bees, the spirit of the mass is turned from the god of nature in order to support the false hive gods, the magisterium of church and state. Just a few quotes for you to understand this word and its use from the Vatican newspaper, uh, Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation on the family is an example of the ordinary magisterium that is papal teaching to which Catholics are obliged to give religious submission of will and intellect, said a recent article in the Vatican newspaper. And now listen to this. I mean, you're not giving religious submission of will and intellect to God. You're giving it to a man wearing a fish hat, the hat of Dogan, who has set up a, a system of idolatry and saints 
and who displays the death of Christ because that's the only way the Pope can claim to be Christ and God as the replacement, the vicar, right? You, you, you're not giving anything to God. You're giving it to a man posing as God, the replacement, the vicar, right? The substitute. This is ridiculous. And this is exactly why the corporation is set up, why the order is set up, so that you're giving your spirit is gone, okay? This is the problem, especially with Catholics. The, the spirit of being a good man under the law is completely gone because you're giving that will, that intellect, to the Pope. You're giving it to, <laughs> you're giving it to an idol, right? So you no longer have spiritual control over your own actions because you've submitted to something artificial, Chemnitz's concern with this uh, eighth kind of tradition, which he saw Trent as espousing, was that it would give theologians and bishops what he called comprehensive license to invent whatever they pleased, freely and with impunity, under the name of tradition. Right? It's tradition for the, the, the Pope to pretend he's God and change the law of God or the Bible. A two-source understanding of Revelation would, moreover, lay the groundwork for justifying whatever the present Roman Church believes, holds, and observes. The corporation. What the corporation believes, not what God is in reality. Not the natural order or its law. No, what the Church believes, holds, and observes is what you're religiously submitting to. While revealing the magisterium of the burden to demonstrate that its current tradition really is apostolic tradition. And that's from tradition and institution, the Lutheran critique, the Catholic dilemma. Like the bees, men are incorporated figuratively, that is, the spirit is removed from their body and placed into the hive of legally driven organized chaos. Free will is thus defeated, for free will is made illegal. If you have to follow the legal law, you cannot follow God's law because they are opposed. That which is spiritually driven must be outlawed, for the soul is not part of the secular, fictional, legal world of man. Why? Because free will is of God, in nature, not of man. See, you think free will emanates from you. It does not. you got to give up this notion that anything is your creation. You, you are part of creation. You're not the creator. So you have to think in this way. In other words, there is nothing actually free or self-evident in anything man invents. A person, a status, a class, a rank has no free will existing only in and under the fiction and artificial law of man, like a chess piece on a chessboard. In other words, you, you have to do what your lot in life, fictional life is. You move one step forward and attack anybody that's to your side. That's what a pawn does. But when that pawn is off that chessboard, what then? See, it doesn't have, there's no use for it. It's pointless. And so are you. You're worthless to God at this point, is the honest truth of it. So you exist just as any type of agent under any form of principle is by definition not free from its master. It cannot be. It only exists under a master in an artificial construct. And take the matrix again as an example. If you're stuck in this virtual reality, then you're doing nothing 100% of the time, you're doing nothing to benefit, protect, love, and cherish, and believe in reality, in nature. You're, you're completely removed from the spiritual world. You're completely dead in the spiritual capacity. Same thing with legalism, I'm sorry to tell you. To possess and utilize the spiritual agency that is the God-given gift of nature, which is free will... The law of God, the supreme master, in other words, must be followed. The example of Christ must be followed, not worshipped in empty idolatry, not the image of Christ by legal hive-minded corporate persons <laughs> that follow man's legal law opposed to God's law of nature. To put it another way, only men that possess free will can actually follow the law of nature. See, that's the problem. Because in legal society, law of nature is outlawed and forbidden. No persons of the legal system have free will. And so it is absolutely 100% impossible 
to be a Christian in the true sense of that word. To be a Christian, one must possess free will. And it's not even right to say possess. One must utilize free will because free will is a fight. It's to be at war against everything that is chaos. It's to be at war against everything that says, hey, no, you don't have free will, which is the legal system and religion. Incorporation into the legal franchise of nation necessarily requires every man to relinquish his free will, relinquish God, and to follow the legal law of man. You cannot be a Christian, period. End of story, sorry. Ordered chaos is dependent upon stealing away the free will of men and redirecting that will into the closed loop system of the legal matrix, the code, the artificial world of man. The material world of the flesh flesh being a metaphor for all the weaknesses and temptations of man that take us away from God's realm and law. We are trapped in the material world of the flesh. From my book, it's weird quoting myself, but let's do it. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, in other words, put them on trial, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. The spirit of Antichrist. You understand? It's kind of like the Christ model. You think this man existed and therefore you worship the idol of the man. Well, you're doing the same thing with the Antichrist. You're worshiping it as some man or beast or something that is an idol. And you're idolizing it as if you're not the one that's the Antichrist. As if I'm not the one. As if everybody in the legal system is not the Antichrist. You see, it's a spirit. And just like you're supposed to worship Jehovah as the spirit. Right? The spirit of the universe, the life force of all that is existence. Right? You're supposed to do the same thing here. What is the spirit of Antichrist? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, it's man. Man's spirit, when redirected, when taken away from his mind and body. Remember what Gandhi said above? When your spirit, your mind, and your body all are in agreement with each other. In other words, they're in harmony. They're in unity. Your body's not doing something that your spirit says no. That is when you have freedom. That is when you have free will and free choice. But the second you do something, you're forced to do something because of this false law that goes against that, you're no longer in a state of free will. You're in a spirit of Antichrist, not the spirit of God. Here we come to an almost insurmountable stumbling block as well, thanks to the vague terms chosen by the king's translators. And again, this is out of my book. This metaphor that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh causes the literalist mind, which we've been entrained to, for a book that's almost exclusively a figurative, uh, metaphoric, allegoric book, telling the story of the law of Christ, is come in the flesh causes the literalist to close down immediately. But of course, as the flesh, or what Strong's G4561 Sarks, probably saying that wrong, is defined as carnal or simply carnal minded. So this term to follow after the flesh is used of those who are on the search for persons, one. Uh, with whom they may gratify their lusts, their desires, their wants, not their needs, right? So this is how we're supposed to view the story of Christ. And the problem is you take that literally and you say, oh, well, Jesus was carnal-minded in the, in the reality. Because in the flesh is something we say to mean, yeah, it's, it's a real thing or it's something of substance, right? But that's not what this was intended to mean. Thayer's Greek lexicon is clear that this is metaphoric, it's poetic, as everything is in the Bible. It's a poetic definition or a metaphoric definition of flesh, the sarks. Uh, and it states that um, the body, not designating it specifically, however, as a skillful combination of related parts and organism, 
but signifying the material or substance of the living body. One body as husband and wife, the human. Something of disease to offer up in sacrifice, my flesh. Christ is speaking life on earth, which is passed in the body, flesh. Paul uses this expression with designed ambiguity in order to involve also the ethical sense to be in power over the flesh, to be promoted and governed by the flesh, operating in the promise that which has been born of the natural man is a natural man, opposed to one who has been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, a natural man is not what you think. That's a ref- reference to an idiot. Okay, one not regenerate is a natural. Natural is not a good word when it's used by legal practitioners. These people who have classified you as natural men right? As idiots, as illegitimate, illiterate persons, essentially, opposed to one who has been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So in other words, one who loves and obeys the word of God, the sensuous nature of man. And that's, by the way, not these people. What what they've done is they've taken certain things to ensure their higher class as quote unquote gods or magistracy. And of course, In order to rule, they have to create the lower class, which is us. And that's personhood. The sensuous nature of man, meaning the animal nature, without any suggestion of depravity, the animal nature with cravings which incite to sin. Finally, in explanation of the personified character of Christ in the flesh, we read, either expressly or tacitly, has an ethical sense and denotes mere human nature, the earthly nature of man apart from divine influence, and therefore proved to sin and opposed to God. Accordingly, it induces whatever in the soul is weak, low, debased, tending to ungodliness and vice. Note that flesh signifies the entire nature of man, sense and reason, without the Holy Spirit. Now, you're going to get arguments from Christians all the time. Oh, no, Christ was in the flesh, right? But he was also God. So somehow you have this juxtaposition of two completely opposing concepts. You're either in the flesh or you're of God. You can't be both, first of all, right? You don't have the Holy Spirit. If you're in the flesh. And why is this so important to consider Christ in the flesh? Because if you consider God and you put it on this pedestal, you call it God, and you say that Christ is somehow superhuman or not of this world, etc., etc., and flesh, by the way, means of the world, (laughs) you have to consider it this way. Because otherwise, you can't become Christ like. You're not above it all. You're not. God? You can't consider Christ that way. Christ has to be considered as a man who overcomes the entirety of what? The flesh. That which signifies the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit. How many times did Christ pray to Jehovah, his father? How many times did he say he's helpless? How many times did he not know what to do? How many times was he tempted by the devil and other things. How many times? In other words, if you're not reading the story of Jesus Christ, the allegory, as something that overcomes, then there's no point in the story because then you can't overcome because there's no example for you to follow. If the example that you're following is something superhuman, supernatural, meaning above nature, something that you can never acquire, there is no point. But you see, you've been trained, entrained, enculturated, and religiously brainwashed to take this as a literal statement that Jesus is in the flesh, not knowing what that word means. Nothing this author can think of could possibly be more difficult than that of attempting to translate the Greek language into the dog Latin we call English, the illiterate language, language of slaves. For how does one speak to a literalist from a poet's perspective. How can romance be translated into cold, hard facts? How can the feeling of expressing love and feeling 
through words be compared to the frustration of using such a mongrel thief of a language as English? How can an allegory, a metaphor, a parable, or any moral story be clearly expressed in proper English? The point of this verse is to stress that Christ was not Jehovah, all of self-existence, nor to be worshipped as such, but instead respected, contemplated, as the Son, the Word, the Law, are the same words, of God, personified as a man tempted by the flesh. And that unlike the perfection of what is Jehovah, which is never any man, but wholly the entire of the universe, all in self-existence, right? Everything in oneness. His character allegorically held the same capacities for weakness of the flesh to the temporal secular world as any man. And this metaphor of the flesh always refers to worldly, secular, sinful, that is artificial, synthetic, Uh, distractions and temptations which Christ must overcome in his moral story and as the example for all other men to follow, not worship. And so we say in verse poetically that he's come in the flesh. He is presented in the flesh. He wouldn't be much of a teacher or mentor to any man if he was a cow or a god, for that matter, immune to that which is designed and persuades any and every man towards sin. And so Christ's story is that of every man as a potential sinner, but also as a potential son of God. He who is not suffering from the human condition cannot be used as an example for others to defeat their human faults. I need to see how to overcome something. I need the example. And so the law, the Son of God, came metaphorically in the flesh, right? The Word of God, the law of God, came in the flesh as the allegory of Jesus Christ, the spiritually living Son, law, Word of God. His example, in other words, is one that every man can and must strive to obtain for themselves to become sons of God of God. To consider Jesus Christ as merely a man that happened to live in the artificial Roman timeline of some historically recorded adventure is to completely miss the message. To worship Christ as a supernatural or something above nature God-man that lived and died without the flesh would be to admonish oneself from the ability to seek and become Christ-like yourself and the capacity to remain that way under the light of the law, the Son. Christ is the Son of Jehovah, not the God of or over Jehovah, or even the same, which, let's not forget, forbids all other gods. So to call Christ as God literally defeats the first commandment. It is foolish to consider the word and commandments of God to have no other gods while at the same time worshiping Jesus Christ as some kind of supernatural God-man. In other words, we're to consider Christ as a man in the story, not worship him as a God. This is an idolatry, or as it's better known, Romanized Christianity of all denominations. And that just means name. Same religion, different name. And it all comes from Rome. I don't care what denomination you call yourself, If you worship Sunday as the holy day, that's a Roman thing. That's declared by the Pope, not God, not the Bible. So you're just acting Catholic. I'm sorry, but speaking of the teachings of Jesus Christ in the Bible, according to their intended verse, to the typical dumbed-down American worker bee is like trying to teach table manners to a zombie with a pile of brains in front of it. And believe me, I was one of the zombie worker bees for much of my life as well, which is why I refuse to give up or be railroaded by the blatant harassment of the ADL and other character assassinating and defaming organizations. I refuse to lose faith in my fellow man, and I'll tell you why. Because to do so is to allow these false gods to rule, to tolerate evil, and to acknowledge without resistance the movie they live. To be exactly what its director says it is, a documentary about the capitalist, human capital, that is, men as cattle, to be traded per the head, human capital, men evaluated per the head like cattle in corporation nations. You might not have noticed, but one of the hidden messages in They Live was in fact to doubt 
humanity. And I got to tell you something, it works. They've caused me to doubt humanity quite often. But I always go back to this and I realize the greatest way to defeat us as a whole is to separate us into parts, to make us doubt each other, to make us think that their depopulation scheme is actually a good thing, to, you know, do everything they can to split us up, to make us hate each other, to make us blame each other instead of these corporations, to make us, the victim, look like the demon. What we are, however, and this has to be acknowledged, is a victim of causality. Why do we act the way we do? Because we're in a system of ordered chaos that these people created. They, they live, right? This capitalist system or whatever system, they're all pretty much the same when you get down to it. You know, obey authority, reward ignorance, worship false idols, do not question authority, stay asleep, conform, do not protest, money is your god. Buy, conform, reward indifference. What was the first thing we said in this reading, right? That apathy and indifference, or tolerance, I should say, are good things. Well, there you go. Sleep eight hours, work eight hours, play eight hours. Of course, obey, consume, watch TV, buy. <laughs> it's just, a, I mean, it's really amazing when you look at this movie, especially probably my favorite movie of all time you know one of the essential three movies that explain the the matrix where we beside you know we got the you got they live you got the matrix and you've got tron um yes tron because tron i think was the first one to uh, differentiate the users with the programs to make you uh, understand the crossover the the sort of metaphoric uh, notion of giving life to the program and watching the program go through and do its master's bidding. Program just means agent, right? User just means principal. Now, this is really the reason why, you know, off the top of my head, these three movies, Tron, The Matrix, They Live. These are the three movies, and I want you to think about this really hard. I want you to think about why it is that you feel like there's a gun to your head, that you have to do everything, that you have to follow this legal system and its law. Why is that? Why is causality so much a part of our lives? Why is it that we believe that these choices between two evils are actually somehow freedom? Why is causality standing as an illusion of freedom? That's the question. Again, we just said franchise is freedom. Those two words are similar. And a slave that is bound to a master certainly has some sense of liberty or freedom. But when we talk about limited freedom, that's always a legal term or franchise. So, yeah, you have freedom, but not from a master. You can operate within a certain set of rules, boundaries, etc., so what is it about the legal system? What has happened to us with regards to this loop, the causality loop that we're stuck in? Why do we do the things we do? Well, I want you to think about this for a moment. These three movies, what did they have in common? Tron, They Live, and The Matrix, right? It's, it's that they unplugged, they got off the grid. Unplugged from the simulation, I got sunglasses that allowed me to see that these weren't actually people, these were my enemy. And then uh, I get off the grid in Tron. I go off grid, that can't be detected. Why? Because I'm a user, not a program. I'm not acting as a program bound by the system. I'm acting as the user. And the user, unless he's identified as the program, cannot be found. It's brilliant. If you think about, again, the metaphoric nature of these movies, and Tron, I think, is one of those hidden ones that I don't think people appreciate as much as I do, anyway. Because it's the perfect realization or manifestation of what I'm talking about, this legal system. And if you, if you go and you look at the terms that are now being used online for these massive multi-player games and stuff, guess what? They're selling digital property, they're selling digital rights, digital identity, digital clothes, digital this, digital real estate... There's laws in the system, there's judicial councils, and you can get an adjudication 
I mean, there's literally what's happening in the computer world right now is essentially what's happening in the real world. We're not buying land. We're buying a paper, the title of land, and just the name, just the title. In the computer world, again, there is no land, and we're buying a title to it. So it, there's really no difference because it's imaginary space it's a jurisdiction that we're establishing for ourselves we believe we're buying land when actually we're just buying paper with paper something worthless for something worthless you see we never actually touch the land that's our whole problem because remember you can't inherit land from what i understand anyway you can't inherit land through money it has to be passed by blood and when you purchase land as a slave you can only purchase the title because you never had any blood relation to that land and if you did it was severed long ago through the birth certification process by the abandonment of your blood ties and rights but these movies again i don't want to get off track these movies why they're so special is because again they're off grid they wake up right in all three cases they wake up and see something they didn't see before what was it that they didn't see before? Freaking reality. Right? The truth. That's what they didn't see. So you got to think that you're in the same situation. We're all in the same situation. We're caught up in a delusion. The Bible calls it the grand delusion. And it explains in the Bible everything that's happening to us today. It says is going to happen. And I can imagine, yeah, it probably didn't make much sense to people 100, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. What are these things the Bible's talking about? Well, they're starting to get pretty clear as we get more advanced in technology. That is art. That is complete simulation hypocrisy, that is. Now, consider why these movies have such a profound effect on people like myself and people like you. Because if you're listening to this show, probably you're at least somewhat curious about this. You know there's something more you can't figure it out. Just like in the movies. Until they get the sunglasses, until someone wakes them up, until the user comes and guides the programs. It's this amazing sort of thing. And so now I want you to consider every other freaking movie, right? There's a reason those movies stand out, and that's because someone actually wakes up to the truth. A Alice in Wonderland type of moment. But every other movie, what's the theme? Oh, I'm presented with a crime. I don't want to do the crime. Oh! Look at there, someone's pointing a gun at my head. Oh, look at there, someone's pointing a gun at my child or my wife's head or my husband's head. They're going to kill my pet or take my money or the, whatever the reason, whatever the plot, the movie's all the same. It is predictively programming you to think, yeah, that's real. That's realistic. That's basically what happens in everyone's life, right? Including mine. That's why I do such horrible things because I have a gun in my head. I do all this uh, mammon. I, I participate in mammon. I participate in credit and debt and being an employee, management and using and being used, right? I do all these things because, hey, that is normal, right? And if I didn't, then someone would probably point a gun to my head or some threat to something... It's always the same, right? These movies, I don't care which one it is, it's always, oh, the guy's right about to do the, the good thing, the good guy's about to win, and then the bad guy. It's so freaking predictable. He takes someone that the good guy loves, and the good guy would sacrifice the entire world for the one he loves. Oh, Really? So you'd sacrifice the whole world for the one you love, even though that means the one you love is going to die because the whole world's dying. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Oh, yeah, I'll save the one so the many die, which includes the one because, yeah, I just gave up all my power to the villain. I dropped my gun. I did whatever it was because guess what? It just always feels like there's a gun pointed at my head. It's a big fat lie, folks. It's one of the lies that especially we in this so-called truth movement, patriot movement, anarchist movement, whichever title you want to put on it, it's always a flattering title. You're not actually the part you're pretending to play. You're not actually living the title of whatever group you follow, are you? I'm certainly not. You know, that doesn't stop me from wanting to know. And maybe one day actually doing something about it. You see... 
What makes those movies special is that for once in your life, you're seeing the good guy actually do the right thing. Abandon the fiction, go back to truth. That's really what it's all about. You don't see that very often. What you see is some victory inside the legal system, some victory that happens because, quote-unquote, justice prevails. Right? You don't see what happens in these other movies, these three specific movies, very often? Think about it. Like I said, it's predictive programming, right? Everything you see is this choice between two evils, this causality that causes you to choose between two things you don't want to do and you choose the less evil. Well, again, is less evil better than more evil? Or is it just that evil is bad? Do we have a choice or do we have to choose between two evils? Well, I'm telling you, no, you don't have to, but we do. Why do we? Because we believe we're this person bound by this legal system and its law. But only the person, only the status, the fiction, is what is bound. See, it's that disconnect from you and that property, that fiction, that slave vessel. That's the problem. That's the thing that these three movies I'm speaking of specifically show. They actually go there. Whereas the rest of Hollywood is just giving you the same old cliche. The bad guy threatens someone the good guy loves, and the good guy completely goes against his morals and judgment, and yeah. It doesn't matter if the good guy wins in the end, because he already broke the law. He already broke his own moral code. It's always the same. It's the threat. All about the threat. And we live according to threat. We're living according to the fear of a threat put on us if we don't follow the law. And you know what? It's your right, remember, to be put in pain, punished, taxed, licensed, and extorted. Oh, that is Title 42, Section 1981. You can look it up yourself. Title 42, Section 1981. We looked at it in the last show, or the first show. What can I say? If you believe you're the person, you must act according to the law of persons. If you believe you're in the Matrix, you're going to be forced to, in the simulation... Act according to the law of the simulation. If you're in They Live, you're going to act according to someone who doesn't have sunglasses. But once you get the sunglasses, then you got to make a choice. Do I fight my enemy or allow it to keep uh, taking advantage of me? And finally, we get to the good old Tron. Are you the user or the program? Well, there is no program without a user. A puppet can't move without the master. You are the master of the vessel. As master, you're the agent of some principle, right? So you're piloting someone else's property, and therefore you're a subject to the owner of the property. The government owns the person. The government is the god of the person, the creator. And the maximum of law says the creator controls. So, again, are you a creation of God, or are you a creation of the state. That's the question you're always going to be asked. Every time you identify yourself, you're answering the question, are you of man or of you of God? That's the question you're answering every time you hand over your identity, every time you write a check, every time you spend money and expect any kind of consumer protections, anything with your name on it, your social security, your pensions, everything, your paychecks, every single time you use that name, that number, that identity, that quote-unquote sameness, artificial sameness, every time you use it, you're answering the question, are you a man of God? And the answer is no. Every freaking time you use that name, that number, that mark, no, I'm not a man. I'm not a man of God. No, I worship a false God, the creator of this person who I pretend to be. And I actually believe I am that person. I really do. I, I mean, I, I identify as, what was it? The projected self-image that I portray myself, which is my person in the Matrix, my projected self-image, what I think I look like, what I want to look like, you know, I'm all suave with a suit, look at me, I look cool, right? The narcissism built into the legal system, the being a person, to be something you're not. That is narcissism in its most basic form. 
None of us are acting as ourselves. Do you see how powerful that is? No person, no one acting in per legal person, no one in the United States that is a public person, a citizenship of the United States, not one is acting as themselves. Think about the power of that. Think about the amazing, amazing power behind that kind of legal magic, that kind of word magic, where you've got everybody believing that you are actually something other than you. You are a fictional character. Imagine the brainwashing. Imagine the spiritual death that you've caused to make people believe they are a fiction. A straw man. Wow. Wow. A man of straw. In other words, someone of no substance. I'm a fictional person. And as we know, a fiction, words on paper, a name has no substance, only form. It's just amazing. That is such incredible. But now it's going national. Now it's going national. Now everyone's getting a... Social security number, social security again in 140 something countries at last I saw under the International Social Security Association in the United Nations. And of course, one of the goals of Agenda 2030, which is what they call Agenda 21 now, one of the goals is national identity for all men, Identi legal identity for all men on earth. There is currently like, I don't know, some ridiculous number, like a billion people that don't have legal identity. Most of them in less than third world countries, if you will. We're talking about the takeover of the entire world. <laughs> Despite the Bible, which warns us over and over and over never to respect flattering titles or persons. In those words, do not respect persons, ever. No excuse, and that includes corporations. Right? This is our whole problem. And yet, they're getting the whole world to not only believe, in other words, love the fact that we're acting as something we're not, as a fiction, and not acting as our, ourselves, our true powerful selves, and therefore not under the law of nature, because we're acting unnaturally. Amazing power. Amazing power. But then to get us to actually carry an identity card, papers, right? Digital, uh, literally a digital chip, <laughs> which can be scanned in our whole history, can be just brought up on a computer in the car behind us, or now automatically when we walk in a store, we literally have been fooled into thinking that giving a little card with our picture on it that says a, a, a legal name, a person's name, that we are surety to, in bondage to, but we've actually been tricked into doing that. You know, what? do you have some identification? Oh, yes, sir, here, please take it. Okay, therefore, you've just identified yourself as one of my subjects. I can do whatever the hell I want to now. I can legally extort you or exact you. I can put you in pain, punish, tax, license, extort. Here, I'm going to give you a $120 ticket, but I'm going to do you a favor. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to take off 10 miles an hour and uh, give you this ticket. It won't affect your insurance. So all you got to do is pay $120 to, how, here, who do I pay it to? Oh, the municipal corporation of blank. Whatever city you freaking live in. Oh, the, the, the county? Same thing. Municipal corporation. Right? In my case, I got a ticket. It was the Salt Lake City Corporation, which is a building, a shitty little building, in fact, right downtown on 6th Avenue. You pass it as you get off the freeway. Seriously, I, I put that in my first documentary, the picture of the ticket. Who do I pay? Salt Lake City Corporation. I mean, how much more clear does it get? This isn't a city, it's a corporation, right? A city is kind of like a church. It's a people, a group of people living together, hopefully like-minded, right? But no, you're talking about a corporation, a fiction. Who did I pay $120 to? The fiction. 
who does the $120 belong to? Well, it already belongs to them anyway. They're just exacting it back. Think about it. Think about taxation for a moment. I don't think you realize how much tax you actually pay. How much tax, for instance, does a dollar bill? Let's say the Federal Reserve takes a dollar bill and puts it in a bank, you know, delivers it to a bank to be used because that bank wrote a fictional note that says, okay, this is worth this much. Okay, so now we have fictional money in the air. It has this false value. How much did that little dollar, what, 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 that, what the hell, how long does it take to double that dollar's value in circulation through taxation? Let's think about it for a moment. Okay, so let's say I'm a dollar. Right, I'm a dollar. I'm just freshly printed off the mint. I'm feeling fucking good, man. I'm going to be used. I'm going to be spent. Oh, man. Pretty soon, I'm going to have my first set of hands laid on me. Oh, man, it's just going to be great. I'm going to just change hands. And who knows? I could end up anywhere. I'm a dollar. It's just so wonderful. Maybe I'll end up in Mexico in some drug cartel's hand. Who knows? Who knows? It's such an exciting thought, the life I'm going to live. And so the dollar gets to the bank. But before the dollar could go to the bank, if you look at the Federal Reserve Comprehensive Annual Finance Report, right? The annual report the governments, all corporations are required to give. Yeah, that's every government agency, every government, over 230,000 in the United States. Every single one of them having to print a comprehensive annual finance report, yet nobody freaking knows or knows how to read the reports. God, how many documentaries, how many articles have I written on it? Still, it's just a dead subject. Nobody talks about it. But if you look at the CAFR for the Mint and the Federal Reserve, you'll see that they take about 53 cents in taxation from each dollar that they print. So before the dollar even leaves the Mint and gets to its first bank, it's already created 53 cents on an average of taxes and fees and costs to mint the dollar, right? They've already taxed the dollar, charged that dollar over half its value. I want you to think about that for a moment. That's not even day one of this dollar's life. It hasn't even been exchanged yet. You can't even say it's a day old. And at that moment when it gets delivered, well, there goes the clock for the interest that's going to be charged daily on every dollar. I can't imagine how much that is at this moment. We won't even add that right now. You know, that's that's the end of the year thing, right? So it goes to the bank. The bank then, someone withdraws something and pays a fee maybe. So there's some more taxation or, or usury that can be put on it, grocery. I get the dollar. I go to a store and I spend that dollar. First day of circulation, what happens? I give the dollar to a clerk. And the clerk says, okay, that'll be... $1 plus 10 cents sales tax, whatever the sales tax is. So immediately, I now have on day one a 60, we'll say 63, I'll say 10% sales tax, whatever. Day one, I have 63 extra magical cents that have been created from this one dollar. So already the dollar has lost, or I, I shouldn't say lost, I'm sorry. Already the dollar has gained in taxation or some kind of fine or fee, 63 cents. We'll call that day one. Day two, get it out. They give it as change. But I mean, technically, they probably gave that same dollar as change to someone else, which, you know, may have went to pay for more taxation. We won't count that. Then the guy goes and he spends that dollar at the next store or it gets paid out to an employee. Well, if it gets paid out to an employee, my goodness, think about that. That's a, uh, oh, I don't know. What do we charge for, for payroll taxes at this point? You got federal, you got state, you got districts, you got municipal charges, you got all these things, social security, all these things. So at this point, well, that dollar just on day, we'll say it, they he paid someone on day two, that's 25, almost 30 cents maybe 37 cents in two days that dollar has already created an extra dollar in taxation that has to be paid and yet how are you going to pay it right now that dollar is essentially a debt instrument it has to be paid back in taxation now you see you consider that that's happening to every dollar on every day 
every single day, every dollar, every $10 bill, which is just $10, right? It's just the same thing's going to happen. So within a week, probably every dollar out there in circulation is, unless someone's just hiding it, is creating its own face value in taxation, fees, fines, and it can't be paid, right? At the end of one day, if you had $100 in circulation and 50 of those dollars at the end of the week accumulated a dollar in taxation or fees or whatever, you'd have to use the remaining 50 to pay those fees that were created using the dollar. And you'd be out of money in a week. Well, gee, why are we addicted to credit? <laughs> why do we need all this credit? How about all these derivatives? Over trillions and trillions of dollars in derivatives. Why do we need all these strange financial instruments? Debt swaps and all these different things. Why do we? Because we're so extremely in debt to ourselves. Not to any other nation, but to ourselves. There is so much form without substance that the true worth of the dollar is literally in the negative. There might be, a, I don't know, what's the circulation of dollars? Is it a billion? Is it a hundred billion? I can't remember. Meanwhile, there's <laughs> how much actual derivatives? There's trillions? In, in, in actual cash, there's billions. But there's trillions, <laughs> a million million in derivatives, in numbers, essentially, empty numbers that somehow are attached to what they call the real money supply, which, of course, is also artificial. I don't know. You know, I could go on for hours talking about this. The point is, I, again, I, I digress. I had to go back to regular unprogramming at this point. Sorry. So, doubt humanity. Join and become part of the incorporation. Because you're not able to self-govern because you're only human. You can't be like Christ. Especially if you worship Christ as an idol, which is exactly what they just got done telling us to do. Worship false idols. They live and thrive because we sleep as any good model of the parasite does, infiltrating and feeding off its unwitting host. In our natural sleep cycle, it is the light that causes wakefulness. In the Bible, the light is knowledge of Jehovah and its law. Through this spiritually driven knowledge, nature is our only true alarm clock, and dear God, is it ringing loudly for us to wake the hell up and out of this secularist, incorporated, spiritually dead ignorance and existence. Also in the Bible, the term world is generally referencing the world invented that is incorporated by men, defined or translated from the word secular. As the chaos of the secular realm, that of the flesh, that which is not spiritual, and specifically that which is artificial, not of the source of nature and God. So, it should be obvious, then, what the term New World Order really stands for, that being a secular order out of the chaos of a non-spiritual existence, and therefore a separation of the natural order and its law from the incorporate order of corrupt men as a single-body corporate, a beehive, right, a body politic, out of many one, says the secular corporation, in its Latin prose. Secular! What is this word, secular? <laughs> Again, from seculum, or the world, or an age. Pertaining to the present world, or to things not spiritual or holy, related to things not immediately or primarily respecting the soul, but the body, worldly. You see, and again, how do they control us? They separate the spirit, the soul. And they use the body by controlling the mind. The moral compass is detached from the brain through legal law, through the secular law. The secular concerns of life respect making provision for the sport of life, the preservation of health, the temporal prosperity of men, of states, etc. Secular power is that which superintends and governs the temporal affairs 
of man, the civil or political power, and is contradistinguished from spiritual or ecclesiastical power. So in other words, you have no religious power, ecclesiastical power, because you're not under that law, and you have no spiritual power because your spirit is separated. The second you go into personhood, you become a secular being. Among Catholics, something that's not regular, not bound by monastic vows or rules, not confined to a monastery or subject to the rules of a religious community. Thus we say the secular clergy and the regular clergy. Secular clergy would be someone they hire to do music or something like that. Coming once in a century as a secular year, secular games in Rome, etc., etc. A church officer as a, as a title, the, the word to be a secular clergy, etc., a church officer or officiate whose functions are confined to the vocal department of the choir, or gives the example. There is the natural order of God, and there is the secular order of men. It's real simple. They are opposed to each other. They are and always will be opposed and repugnant to one another unless the order of man falls under or subject to the order of nature and its law. I did a show last year on the details of this new world secular order. For those interested, here's the link. As we can see, though, there are a multitude of ideas describing what is order. Yet, self-evidently, there is only one natural order. And the natural order would be, again, a verb, like Jehovah. Whereas an order set up by man would be a name or a noun, a title for something that isn't real. Now, the natural order we would sometimes call the logos, sometimes the law of nature, and sometimes even the light of God. By these similar terms is always referenced a sense of order, never chaos. In other words, design. Design implies order, and order implies law. But what if your goal is to foment chaos? What if the only possible way to gain control is to first cause chaos and then to control that lawlessness through your own artificial design? Because what comes with design but law? Is this not the basis of all cartoons, to change or completely destroy the law of reality so as to recreate in a completely artificial construct? Is this not a description of the legal system of man's law and the artifice it controls, that is, governs? And is this not the same type of rules found in the simulation presented in the Matrix movies? For what is the Matrix but a programmable and therefore reprogrammable system of man-made order? But the question is really not what is the Matrix, but what isn't the Matrix? And this is the answer we must endeavor to find, for it leads to the light. The light, that is the knowledge of truth, is always found in the negative. Truth springs forth only from one source, the natural order. The scriptures teach us one very important foundational lesson, a self-evident truth of nature that cannot be denied. It is simple and empowering, but also meant to be a limiting factor upon the actions of all men, the most basic of the laws of nature, which is that everything man-made is temporary. What is built of the hands of men is not part of the natural order, that is, not of God's creation, kingdom, realm, and law. What is man-made is not of the order of nature, but of the chaos of anti-nature. What is man-made always fails eventually, which leads to the rot and decay of nature, reclaiming what man once invented without nature's permanence of design, without its law. And so the most ordered society of men can only be that whose highest law is to respect, worship, cherish, and preserve the natural order, and to follow its law inasmuch as is humanly possible through Christ's example. This is why you have to consider Christ in the flesh. This is why the story is of a man tempted by the flesh but overcoming it. This notion is described by the scriptures in many forms, for instance, do unto others as you would have done to yourself, or do not pretend you are something when you are no thing. From Genesis, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, 
For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every thing living as I have done. Now, people look at that and they say, oh, God, my imagination is not evil. You're missing the point. All right. Don't take it as an insult. Don't take it as anything but what it means. What comes from imagination? What do you imagine? Well, you don't imagine the truth, right? So necessarily, if you're imagining something, because nature's not providing it, it's an evil thought. Now, good or bad? Not necessarily. Right? You don't need to think of it that way. You only need to understand that any time you imagine something that doesn't exist, that is going against nature's order. Right? That's it. It's a neutral statement. It's not meant to be this, oh, God is such a jerk. Right? No. <laughs> what this is referring to is Noah. Why the earth was being destroyed. Because everything that man imagines... And builds and creates in this secular way, this non-spiritual way, which is against nature's order, God's design, is, of course, evil. Again, you, you have to take it for, for why it's intended and stop putting human characteristics, these entrained fallacious thoughts on these Bible verses. Take them neutrally. Never be offended by anything I say or anything the Bible says. Take it neutrally and apply it to yourself. You know, don't be afraid to look at yourself. That's the whole point. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now this statement has been misused and mistranslated and, and purposefully put forward to justify all kinds of evils unfortunately, because of its translation. Because it continues here. It says, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. How frightening is that? Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Now, again, if you consider this in a literal fashion, it sounds like, hey, God just gave me the earth to do as, you know, make me a little God on earth and I can do whatever the hell I want. I can, I can treat all of God's creation the way I'm treating it today, factory farming and poisons, and I can just do anything I want. That's no, no. God blessed Noah and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Replenish the earth, implying that, hey, maybe, uh, you know, something's going to get destroyed. <laughs> but the most important part of this is talking about the fear. I mean, imagine nature fears man. Nature fears the imagination of man. Nature fears the invention of man. Why? Because nature, that is God, the omnipresent spirit of the universe, understands that anything that man does is going to be adversarial, satanic, that is, to nature. I mean, again, you have to consider this poetically. You have to consider you even have to consider it empathetically. Because the way we treat nature, the way we treat life, other life, including other men, is, is deplorable. It's horrible. It's painful for the empathetic man. And we tolerate it. We have apathy for it. We know it's happening and we do nothing. And perhaps that's why the dread <laughs> of us is upon every beast. See, this is meant to be a spiritually uplifting and empowering verse. It's not meant for you to take or from some corporate church or state to take and say, we own everything. No, we're in dominion because nothing else, we have no predator. And therefore, we are supposed to be responsible. We're supposed to be in service to the earth. 
We're supposed to be in love and husbandry to it. We're not supposed to conquer it and make it our submissive slave. That can only lead to our own destruction. As I live, saith the Lord God, that is again a reference to Jehovah, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, Neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. This, in Ezekiel 34, 8, is a perfect example of what has become of us. The legally minded shitstorm, the chaos that's been created. Okay? We've become the prey. And that which we are supposed to watch over to shepherd has become the victim of these corporations of our state of incorporation, of our spiritualist existence. We feed ourselves at the expense of that which fears us, nature, right? All life. We destroy. We have no respect. We have tolerance and apathy for the destruction of that which sustains us, that which is our source. We don't worship our source. We don't worship nature as our God, and therefore we do everything we can to disrespect it. Well, that changes things a bit, doesn't it? Why did Jehovah tell Noah to be fruitful and multiply, replenish, and have dominion over the earth and all living things upon it? Because what man was doing to it before the story of Noah was evil. And to nature, man was acting as a curse upon it, much like we are again today. you got to remember, man, Jehovah was speaking as the world, as earth. Again, you can't think of Jehovah as a man that comes down to, and talks to Noah. No, this is like personifying or anthropomorphizing earth coming to Noah and saying, look... You're screwing me. You're, you're, you're doing everything you can. And I bless you because you're a good man. Noah is a word that actually means to be at rest. In the concordances, in the lexicon, Noah means to be at rest. And then Noah has three sons. And those sons, have, the words have meaning. And those words all are like angry or this or that. The sons of Noah are three states of emotional distress or unspiritual thought where do you go from being at rest and being in in harmony with god and you know the ark and all that stuff you're a generation of man and then you have new generations these aren't meant to be actual sons where do you go from rest right this is why every name in the bible has a specific meaning jesus christ means jehovah is salvation all the words, all the names, Noah included, Moses, all of them have specific meanings. In this case, Noah means to be at rest. In other words, not acting against God's law. This is why he was blessed. This is the story of all of us. Remember, we travel back and forth between those names. Sometimes I could be Noah, I could be at rest, I could be in harmony with nature and its law. Sometimes I can be Judas Iscariot, sometimes I can be all of these different characters there, and and believe it or not, sometimes I can be Jesus Christ. Sometimes I can be Christ-like, in other words, I can actually emulate and follow the example, which is the ultimate goal. This is the story of all of us without exception, for we have not been good shepherds. We're not being good shepherds. Even the best of us, even the most caring, loving people who cry when that freaking commercial comes on television about dogs being abused, right? We're, you know, for the empathetic man, we're in misery all the time. And we put on a smiley face because we're, we're in apathy. We're not doing anything about the abuses that are happening. We're not acting in God's law. We are ignoring it. We are not acting as protectors. <laughs> we're not acting as guardians of the galaxy. Right? We're, not, we're, we're, we're completely and 100% bound by the secular order, the legal system. And therefore, 
rather than do what is right morally by our moral compass, because our spirits have been stolen from us, we strive to feed only our own mouths. Charity be damned. Even using the Bible to justify our actions against all living things of the earth as God's will. Taking that sentence to go and multiply and replenish without any responsibility, in other words, without self-governing. No, you can't. (laughs) That's going to end in tragedy. The good shepherds would protect the flocks of all living things on earth from man, not merely from predatory animals. A man is not meant to be a predator, but instead protective of that which sustains his existence, for the existence of man is part of Jehovah. And so, by the awful grace of God, man was spited from the earth for crimes against nature and all life. What fool cannot draw this same parallel to man's disposition or bad position in nature today? What man is at rest? What man is Christ-like? I don't see any, including myself. The corporate religious gobbledygook that loves to revision Genesis 9, 1 through 3 as some lame excuse or permission from God itself that we have the essentially free reign to use all of nature and life as meat without being responsible, caring, empathetic, protective, and regenerative that is replenishing towards uh, God's creation is truly a perfect examination of how organized men in corporations calling themselves as religions destroy the word that is the law and therefore nature, the design of God. Temporarily, anyway. And of course, meat, there's another word that has several different meanings, metaphoric ones. Man has been entrained to treat all of nature as a victim, as prey, as fodder, as that which is beneath us in every way. Yet nothing could be less biblical, less spiritual, than this line of fallacious thought. Now let's reconsider this verse and the great universal responsibility in parts. Creation fears man. For creation is subject to the chaos and great follies of man's false and fallacious logic. Religious sects of false Christianity incorporated into orders of controlled chaos use only the first part of this verse, be fruitful and multiply, as if it's an excuse to bear unreasonable amounts of children, which the corporate church then views as potential future members, future tithes, taxes, uh, you know, spiritual taxes, if you will, and evangelists for their own antichrist purpose. In other words, to spread the corporation, the church, to indoctrinate men in false doctrine. Their intent is artificial, monetary, always in benefits of the corporate order, and intent of the false church, seldom the following of scriptural teachings and law. Never does the corporate church speak of the awesome responsibility to ensure the natural order that is the addendum to this oft-misused verbiage. These verses have one of two effects upon men. On the one side, for the illiterate masses, the publicly educated goyim who've been taught that science and nature, that is God, are somehow detached from each other, We find the geneticist, the eugenicist that is, the sport hunter and the warmongering conquerors of the natural order, abusers of animals, insects, and men, all contained and governed, that is, mind-controlled, in their chaos by legal means. And I want you to understand, mind control is not just controlling the mind, it is abandoning the spirit. You can't control the mind If the spirit is present, that's the point. Mind control, in other words, is the killing of man's spirit or moral compass. On the other side, we find the humility of spiritual understanding of the great care and responsibility that comes with such a gift and the self-actualization of that same fear toward the chaotic darkness of unenlightened, non-spiritually driven men. We, in other words, we are part of nature and we live in fear of the imaginations of men as well. For we are of the same nature, Jehovah, as that which we abuse. And we, we should fear ourselves, in other words, in reflection of this horde of chaotic men being the vast majority, some pray helplessly and without action to God for their forgiveness and that of their own 
forgiveness. Some act out in eco-terrorism, some become vegan, some become animal rights activists. Most become apathetic and tolerant, and a few just become straight-up eugenicists. Madmen. Ultimately, the world of man's invention is 100% built on image. And that just means idolatry. Image, a representation or similitude of any person or thing formed of a material substance, as an image wrought of stone, wood, or wax. A statue, an idol, the representation of any person or thing that is an object of worship. Well, you know, I hate to say it, but that's what you've done to Christ, you corporate religions. The second commandment forbids the worship of images. Well, why do you have a picture of Christ in your house then? Why do you have a cross? Why do you have any symbol at all? Why do you have images that you worship? When the second commandment says don't. And see, this is why I'm so excited about understanding the Bible. Because it means I don't have to pretend to do any of the shit that these people do. Right? And again, I don't mean offense. But the point of the Bible is to not get involved in these cults. To not get involved in these religions. To not have a cross. To not have an idol. To not have these representations, these these similitudes, these hypocrisies, in other words, and instead actually live the part. Don't worship the idol of peace. Be peace. Don't worship the idol of law, Christ. Be Christ. Don't worship the idol of God. Be part of God and follow its law. But instead, we are solely a secular system And in order to set up that chaos, image worship is extremely important. Idolatry is everything. Everything must be adulterated, including us. So again, the second commandment forbids the worship of idols, the likeness of anything on a canvas, a picture, a resemblance, painted, any copy, representation, or likeness. How many different pictures of Christ are there out there? You got black Jesus, you got white Jesus, you got Jewish Jesus, you got this Jesus. I mean, the thought that you're assigning skin color to Christ is even a sign of the idiocracy that Christians have become. Semblance, show, appearance, the face of things, frightful image bears, an idea. Remember an invention or the imagination of men that nature fears? An idea, representation of anything to the mind, a conception, a picture drawn by fancy. Guess what? If you think about the matrix, the whole thing is an image. Well, see, the problem is the matrix should also be taken as an allegory or a metaphor for the legal system, which is purely a representation. You literally appear in person. You appear as something you're not, a representation, right? You represent yourself or you get representation. You understand everything in the legal realm is an image, an idol, a similitude, but not the same because the law says in, in, in all arts and science and truth that a similitude is not a sameness. What is similar is never the same, An idea, a representation of anything to the mind, a conception, a picture drawn by fancy we can conceive. In rhetoric, a lively description of anything in discourse which presents a kind of picture to the mind. Right Now, if you're talking about Jesus and you have a picture of Jesus in your mind, you're committing idolatry. You're thinking of Christ in the image instead of thinking of yourself as becoming Christ-like. You're not going to learn anything or get anything from the image. Neither are you going to get anything from thinking he's a man. You're only going to get something out of his actions by emulating his actions. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't matter what image you have of Christ. The image is worthless. It's pointless. And they know this. And that's why they want you to be in this state of imagery of idolatry. I mean, this should be obvious. A mirror reflects the image of a person standing before it, as does water in a vessel. To imagine. Remember the imaginations of man? 
that nature is afraid of, to copy by the imagination, to form a likeness in the mind by the fancy or recollection. How can you possibly recollect Christ? You weren't there. Not that there was a there. <laughs> you, you, you can't have an image of something that you never experienced. If you do, it's complete idolatry. Like, without question, 100% idolatry, right? Because you have no actual experience of him. And so you're, you're getting tripped up on the image. You're getting tripped up on the appearance. You're getting tripped up on the idol and losing the entire point or source of the image. And then therefore the image takes upon itself a life of its own and therefore it becomes no longer a simulation but a simulacra. A copy without an original. The symbol no longer has any relevance or reference to what it originally bore or the original point of it. You see, that's the problem. The image of Christ has nothing to do with the point or purpose of Christ's allegory. And this goes into the same thing we do to ourselves. We accept the identity of our false person. We accept that the law can be broken, that similitude can be sameness, and therefore we identify ourselves as something that is artificial. And identity means sameness. The fact, right, not the truth, but the fact that a subject, a person, or a thing before a court is the same as it is represented, claimed, or charged to be. What is representation? Imagery. Similitude. Idolatry. We're literally appearing as idols. <laughs> the, again, a thing before a court. Remember what we said about the court? The court doesn't exist until it's called to what? Order. And so we have identification. We have proof of identity, right? We have a fact that says we're a person. <sighs> Not a truth. Right? The proving that a person, subject, or article before the court is the very same that he or it is alleged, charged, or reputed to be. Well, that can only mean one thing, folks. We are not showing up as ourselves. We are not self-evident men of God. The only reason you need to prove identity is because you're not acting as yourself. That's the only reason. And the reason, again, that your identity can be stolen is because it is not you. It is a similitude, which is never a sameness. But remember, once you accept identity, you have accepted the lie, the fact, the legal fact that you are in sameness with that persona, that mask that you're wearing called a legal person. And this is how chaos is established and put into order. The word same does not always mean identical. <laughs> more legal speak, more lawyer speak here. The word same does not always mean identical, and that's why <laughs> I'm trying to tell you it's a fact, not a truth. Not different or other. It frequently means of the kind or species, not the specific thing. So when you identify yourself, what you're really doing is you're saying, I am equally punishable under the law. I have no God-given rights, only the rights the government gives me. I have the right to be extorted, put in pain, punished, taxed, licensed, extorted, exacted. Right? That's what I'm saying. I am the same. Okay? It doesn't mean... I'm saying that I actually am that fictional thing. It means I'm of that kind. It means species, not a specific thing. So in other words, we believe in species. We believe in the words that are used as titles, flattering titles, names, and therefore we pretend, or that is a fact, that we are in sameness. It's a difficult thing to grasp, but once you grasp it, you realize the, the root of all your problems, the root of every reason that, you're, that you no longer have free will is this word, same, identity. Remember, sameness does not equal similitude. Identity does not equal sameness. It does equal 
kind or species or class. It's so hard to put into words. Similitude, and this is very important. Uh, likeness, resemblance, likeness in nature, right? My person is my likeness in the legal realm. I am the likeness of my person in nature is what I say, what I respect. The qualities of appearance, of idolatry, of image, a similitude of substance. But it's not sameness. It's never the same. You can never say you're the same as a person unless you have that previous alternative meaning of the word. It's a comparison, a simile. You're literally a simile of yourself when you're acting in person. Let us make man in our image. In other words, man in our similitude. Not sameness. Okay. Kind or species. Now, I talked about this, let us make man in our image. Why is it us? Is God schizophrenic? No, because it's not talking about God. It's not talking about Jehovah. It's talking about something completely different. It's talking about the creation of false man, of persons. It's talking about the creation of the secular world. Let us make man in our image. This is men recreating men so they can control them in the world of order. Jehovah is not even mentioned in that first part of the Bible, that first chapter. There's two possibly three different creation stories. One is the creation of man, of the secular world, and one is the creation of reality, of nature, of the world, of earth. Personhood is idolatry, the representation of a lie, a legal fiction. We must prove through legal, as fictional, imaginary fact, uh, our identity, our sameness to some idolatrous form of a fictional character not real in order to have artificial legal existence within the legal system, within the game, within the matrix. Simulation. In other words, while in personhood, everything we do is done in idolatry or, in other words, in simulation. But what does that word mean, simulation? How is this different than plugging into the virtual reality of the Matrix simulation, uh, according to the movie, right? Everything's artificial. The answer, it's not. It's a metaphor. The Matrix is a visual, virtual representation of the legal system. Complete and utter control and detachment or incorporation of the man, the body, the mind, minus the spirit. But that is not our query today, remember, for that only answers the positive, which is the question, what is the matrix? Obviously, the matrix is not real. It's a similitude, a representation requiring a false identity. The matrix is a closed-loop system of idolatry, a copy, a modern re-imaging of a copy, a history, a postmodernist sort of surrealism. In other words, it's a simulacrum, meaning that which is a copy of some original, some source, that is so far removed, changed, morphed, and altered from that original model, source, so as to be completely different or anti to its original, however, offering the appearance of similitude only. Not sameness, just similitude. Big difference. A copy without any essence of its original model. The so-called United States Corporation of today is, for instance... There in Washington, D.C., a simulacrum of what its original form and intent was when this so-called country was created, uh, the Articles of Incorporation. But most importantly, the legal law system operates upon the same type of algorithm or code, that is law, as the matrix simulation in a very important all-encompassing way, order out of chaos. What is the human mind and body when the spirit is separated away from it? They tell us, of course, that we must obey the legal law, the law of man. The church tells us that too, remember, the law of the land. And therefore, if we do that and we act in idolatry towards Christ, according to the church doctrine, whatever denomination you're in, then and only then can we be quote-unquote saved and go to heaven. In other words, our soul will pass on to that. But see, they never talk about your soul in any other way. It's just always something that's in the afterlife, as they call it. Afterlife, not a word in the Bible, by the way. There is no afterlife in the Bible. That is a word created by religious scholars. 
by theists, people who <laughs> who create things out of fiction, imagination. There is no after life in the Bible. There's other things that are similar, but that word does not exist in the Bible. So, in other words, they don't speak about what the Bible really is, which is a guide for your spirit and mind and body. It is how to control the spirit. So, the question then becomes, again, this matrix idea, this legal system, how can such a separation of the human spirit be conductive to moral thought and action? Well, it can't. That's the point. In other words, what better way can there be to control men but to take away our spiritual release, our ability to tap into the spirit of the universe, our ability to judge for ourselves what is morally acceptable or not? What better way can there be to create a hive mind from individual men but to separate the spirit, the soul, from the mind and the body so that it's no longer in control? They... Mm, they are in control. How much like a machine, like a slave, can men be turned into when such separation takes place? Well, look around. We call them employees. What possible notion of free will can a man have if his spirit is defeated by the legal code? If his spiritual moral law is outlawed by that which is the legal code? Think about what the legal law does. It outlaws any deviation from the program design of the legal matrix, right? You can think of other movies that fall into that. The reason I say greetings programs before every show, it's an ode to the movie Tron. He calls them programs. He's a user, right? You are a user, and you're using a program. In other words, a person. It's the same thing, right? You've got this fictional representation of the world, in Tron. It's a brilliant movie if you actually sit down and watch it and listen to what it's saying. And it's very, very scary that it's actually coming true. The master computer, right? But uh, the AI, you're talking about a movie that very well expresses what personhood is. You, again, plug into this sort of matrix, if you will, and suddenly you're a program. Well, that's exactly what a person is. It's a program controlled by the agent, the user, which is controlled by the principal or the employer. Again, a very telling thing. If you could put aside whatever feelings you have about it, just like people who don't like science fiction or whatever, there's so much to learn from these movies if you have the right understanding of these terms and how they apply to us. And how we're actually acting as those programs, as users. But another word for this replacement of free will is causality. Another term that was certainly touched upon in a great way in the movies. The simulated death of the spirit by abstraction of free will. What is abstraction? What does it mean to be in the abstract, which is where we are in the legal realm? It's the act of separating, the act of being separated. In other words, from our spirit, from our soul. We no longer control our mind, someone else does. The operation of the mind when occupied by abstract ideas, as when we contemplate some particular part or property of a complex object as separate from the rest. For instance, the value that we put on things in monetary purview. We, 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 we're so caught in the abstract of things that we forget the real. In other words, we're talking about a simulation, right? Something that's simulated. Thus, when the mind considers the branch of the tree by itself or the color of the leaves as separate from their size or figure, the act is abstraction so also when it considers whiteness, softness, virtue, existence as separate from any particular objects. And that's our problem, isn't it? We consider even ourselves. Narcissistically, we only consider ourselves. The notion of polytheism would be to consider a, a certain parts of existence, right? Of self-existence, of Jehovah as a separate God, an abstract. The power which the understanding has of separating the combinations which are presented to it is distinguished by logicians by the name of abstraction. 
Abstraction is the groundwork of classification, by which things are arranged in, oh, surprise, orders, genera, and species. Now remember, species means special. When you say the word special, you're actually saying special, a species of something, because it's special, it's classified, it's an order. It's like a, uh, a higher or more generic term for order. A species. Special. We separate an idea, the qualities of certain objects, which are of the same kind, from others which are different in each, and arrange the objects having the same properties in a class or collected body. In other words, a corporation like the United States or any other nation that holds all the goyim, right, all the Gentile, in one body politic, one hive mind, as equal lower class citizens. We are separated and put under this law which separates us even further from our spirit, from our free will. A separation from worldly objects, a reclusive life as a hermit's abstraction. It can also be the absence of mind. This abstract notion of legal personhood is certainly an absence of mind a lot of times because your causality Instead of choice, you have only two choices, and each of those choices leads to the same place. I'm going to vote Democrat. I'm going to vote Republican. Well, congratulations. You just supported the main royal family that's been in charge for generation after generation. They're all cousins. You're voting for the same family. You know, what is a, a corporation? Another word for a corporation is family. Inattention to present objects. Wow, that sounds just like humanity at this point, doesn't it? The world is burning. The world is dying all around us, and we're just not really paying attention. In the process of distillation, the term is used to note the separation of the volatile parts, which rise and come over and are condensed in a receiver from those which are fixed. Now, this is important to use the metaphor here, the separation of the volatile parts. Well, the soul is certainly volatile to the legal system. The spirit, that beautiful, wonderful spirit of man, when it is <laughs> in tune with nature, in tune with Jehovah, in tune with Logos, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so it's very volatile, or it would be very volatile to anything that tries to interfere with that. But we're so far removed, so far in the abstraction that our spirits have already been separated from us. We no longer have free will or choice. Therefore, we cannot justify our actions under God. We have no right to fight against this system because the law says we can't. And so we don't. We're afraid of the consequences. Screw the consequences of ignoring the laws of nature. Screw the consequences of turning our backs on the very source of our existence and sustenance. No, 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 no. We're afraid of words on paper. And uh, the classic gun pointed to you know, service at the barrel of a gun. That's what we're afraid of. Again, we have the wrong fear. The point of distillation? To change its state, right? Or the nature of its composition. It's exactly what they do to you through public education, through entertainment, through all of this crap that they put us through, including this stupid election. How many times do you hear it each election cycle? Or better yet, how many times has it been your own lame excuse for voluntary participation in the futility of the legal matrix system? You must vote! Vote, they say. Vote or die. It's your civil duty. Vote or die. We're told that voting is our only outlet for change, for any kind of hopeful improvement in this debtor's hell, like slaves voting for better cots or something. You know, you, you, th that voting is somehow our only legalized, that is, approved and enfranchised expression of what it is to live in a free country. And you've got to laugh at that, because in a free country, you wouldn't vote. <laughs> there would be no... If you were free, you wouldn't have a ruler. You wouldn't have a leader. You're not free. Free slaves is what they really mean. Legal enfranchisement. U.S. citizenship. Remember, the slaves weren't freed. They were enfranchised. And then when the birth certificate process came out, 
after what they called emancipation, which is the incorporation of a man into the, into the nation, they offered it to everybody. It was a new citizenship that didn't exist before, according to the 14th Amendment, and they opened it up to everybody as an enfranchisement to citizenship, to this lower class of citizenship. It's not a state of being free unless you consider, again, a rat is free in its cage. A bird is free in its cage. You go anywhere in the cage just like you can go anywhere in the legal jurisdictions. In Caesar, in Caesar's realm, in the district. Again, federal areas, not private lands. Is there really a difference between being a citizenship, a commercial vessel, and being plugged into the Matrix simulation? Of course there's not. The movie is merely a representation of the legal system, of a false existence, a hypocrisy experienced in a persona bound by the legal code, programming, that is, programs like from Tron, that is designed to ensnare and frame us in a sophisticated form of art. Technology. Remember, technology just means art. That's it. No other definition. Art is merely a simulation of the real, an abstraction of existence, form without substance, as the mind and body separated from the soul, which is, again, your spirit. Causality requires no spirit. Art is a snapshot of time. Man-made time. Art is a snapshot of time having existence without life. We live and we die without ever actually diverging from the pre-designed paths set out for us to follow, like game pieces upon a board game. Avatars whose every move is controlled by the limited role of the game master, that is, the legal designer's dice, is law. And we believe, with all our mind, that as pawns, we can only move or be moved according to the rules of the legal code. The instructions for this game of commerce. What is a board game, folks? I mean, they're all the same. It's commerce. It's an abstract limited sort of view of the commercial world. Whether it's Monopoly or the Game of Life or Candyland, you're, you know, you're, you've got a monetary reward in almost all of them of some sort. You know, you might get candy instead or you might get to be the first to the gingerbread house so you can gorge yourself, right? Anything to get you to the, the final destination of some sin. With the legal law as our blinders, we indeed move one step forward at a time without ever realizing we are controlled by that gaming matrix, by the programming as programs stuck in a causal loop that makes any other choice appear impossible. If you haven't figured it out yet, voting is not a choice. It's a causality. Big difference. If I give you a choice between two objects and I control both objects then I've only offered you a purely aesthetic choice, an abstraction. For your choice is between two agents of the same principle, two fingers of the same hand. Another word for voting is to pray. That is actually a synonym. To pray, remember, the judges of the courts 100 years ago were called gods. That's why I'm, I'm insistent that you understand this word, that you prayed, not pleaded, but prayed to the god of the court. That is, on all the transcripts. To pray is to wish. To wish is to hope. To hope is to remain impotent, inactive, passive, non-self-governing. What is hope but a state of despair? I mean, really, if you're hoping for something, it means you don't have it. And he that is banned of his own spirit certainly is going to be in a permanent state of hope. And one of those ways of expressing hope is voting which is probably the stupidest thing you can do, but it's, it's, you know, it's your job. It's your, it's your duty, as they say. So there's a fine line between hope and despair, or perhaps it's that hope and despair can't exist without each other. It's not my opinion, really. It's actually how it's defined. Just click here and ask, uh, ask Noda. Remember, I don't know if you've, if you haven't seen my, uh, <laughs> None of the above video. It's uh, it's on my other YouTube channel at the Corporation Nation on YouTube. 
And it explains the whole electoral system and why it's a sham. It's a fraud. It's completely pointless for you to vote because your vote isn't counted in the presidential elections. And it tells you why. There's no question. There's no debating this. It's... <laughs> It's so obvious, but you have to do the research, right? You have to be aware. You have to have some modicum of spirit to, to possibly get to the point where you can find this information out. You see, a choice necessarily implies that there is a choice to say no. That is the ultimate, ultimate spiritual answer. No, I refuse to act immorally. I refuse to be in the abstract. I refuse to vote for something that is, for all intents and purposes, my slave master. That's ridiculous. If I have a choice, whether I want to jump off a bridge or not, it's the ability to go with the negative, the no aspect, and walk away from that voluntary action that lets me know I really hold the power to choose, actually have free will. But if I'm presented instead with a positive causal choice to either jump straight off the bridge, feet first, or do an amazing triple flip somersault off that same bridge, well, then this is no longer a choice, but a causality. I have no choice not to jump, right? Just like I have no choice not to vote for one of the candidates presented. Therefore, my current situation of causality, a false inevitable choice between two positive evils, and by positive, I mean something that man creates, it's presenting itself because of some choice I actually made previously that placed me under some legal contractual obligation to jump today. In other words, personhood. Agency. However, the administrator of my course and limited action has beneficently, as they say, offered a choice on how I wish to jump, voluntarily or by force. The negative aspect that is under God's law has been removed. Free will has been removed, for I cannot say no. If I can't say no to Hillary Clinton, but also say no to Donald Trump, then I have no actual choice. If I cannot choose not to cause harm to myself or others, then I am certainly stuck in a causal loop of self-defeat and deceit. This is the illusion. Causality is the illusion of free choice. To be clear, free choice is not at all the same as free will. We shouldn't get these confused. If you have free choice in the legal matrix, you therefore do not have inherent God-given free will in nature. For you may never choose no. You cannot be in both realms, God or mammon. Your will is defeated by the false paradigm of a choice between two or more pre-presented evils, which most often are merely arms of the same body pretending to be opposed to each other. All levels of evil are still part of evil. When good men have no choice but to make a bad choice, this is causality. Remember, the word free in legalese means franchise, and a corporate franchise, that is personhood, while acting in agency... All choices are given by the principal, the master, the employer, and that choice does not include the right to say no to the master or its design. In fact, it includes no inherent rights at all, no God-given rights whatsoever, including the spirit and including the right to say no. Just pre-programmed causality, or in other words, a false sense of choice between two already prescribed and offered evils. Free will does not exist in the legal realm. It is a God-given gift found only outside the strict law of the legal matrix simulation and is reserved only for those able to be self-governing and therefore self-responsible. In other words, it's reserved for the spiritual man, for the meek, for he or she that is of God. That's that. I mean, that's that's not even a colloquialism. That's not even a metaphor. That's literally how it works. Like I, we covered that in the last show, looking at what Christianity is compared to the, what the Bible is really, a book of law. And if you don't understand that, I I don't know how to explain it. Really, I don't. I can't go any farther. If you want to be contrarian, atheist, all these different things, I can't stop you. I really can't. As irreasonable and illogical 
as it is when you actually know the definitions of these terms like Jehovah, to deny Jehovah is to deny existence. I just don't know how any other way to say it. It's ludicrous. But they want you to act ludicrous. They want your spirit dead to where you don't even believe in your own self, your own existence, that you're melancholy, that you're complete slave. But listen to what the Bible says. For all those fake Christians out there who constantly tell you, oh no, there's no law. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. He can be your friend. You can have a personal relationship. I don't know what that fucking means, but okay. No. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. Not your silly belief in some image or idol of Jesus Christ. Now, the law. Jesus Christ is the personification of law. Okay? Not an image. Not some idol. Not some simulacrum that is so completely detached from the Bible word, the law, that you have no idea what you're worshiping. An unknown God, as the Bible says. The law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. It doesn't get any clearer than that. It really doesn't. What is the way of life? Jesus Christ, the law. Not holding, not wearing a cross and, and then sinning, and as the Catholics do, wear their sin on their lapel with this little cross. It, it's just, none of it makes sense, and you know it doesn't make sense. You know it's way too easy. It's way too freaking easy, and I think that's why people actually go to Christianity, this organized system, because it's too freaking easy. It's so easy. You don't have to do anything, right? It's a lie. From John 12, 35 through 36 and 44 through 50, out of the King James Bible, we read. And then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. What is the light? The law. What is personhood? Darkness. What is legality? Darkness. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. No, you don't need to know because you don't have your spirit. All you need to know is a set of instructions, of legal instructions as an employee, an agent of government. You don't have to make any decisions. And that's why people are drawn to citizenship instead of being free men. Most of the free men in history have said, in some quote or the other, that most men will never be free because they just can't handle it. He can't handle not only the self-responsibility, the self... You, you, you don't want to be yourself. You want to be something else. Again, what the Bible is against. Right? You want to have the protections of identity. You want to have these false rights because you don't think you can handle yourself in reality. That's what it is. And they make it so appealing. Don't get me wrong. I'm right there with you. Again, when I speak of you, I really mean me. Right? I'm looking in the mirror here. Don't get confused. While ye have light, believe in that light, that ye may be the children of light, the sons of God. Right? These things spake Jesus and departed and did uh, hide himself from them. Jesus cried and said, because of course they were after him. They're always after anybody who's self-governing. Jesus cried and said, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him, that is Jehovah, that sent me. He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Now again, how much clearer can it get for you who are going to church and worshiping an idol? And half of you don't even know the name of God. Well, you should by now. If you watched the last show, you know that the church has hidden the name of God for centuries. They've hidden it. And they've sold you this idol and told you to worship it instead. So that they can devastate nature. And so that they can cause you to not defend nature. Creation, that is. So that they can ravage it and incorporate it, and sell it. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light, in other words, law, into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. But wait a minute. He just said, he that believeth me is actually believing in Jehovah. So when he says, 
whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Hey, in other words, whoever believes in Jehovah, where Jesus is the expression of Logos, the law of nature, the law of the universe. So in other words, what they've done is they've created an abstract out of Jesus Christ. Instead of Jesus being what is coming forward from Jehovah, from nature, the law, they've created a separate God, a false God, exactly against the commandments. It's pretty amazing when you actually look at it and understand what has happened, what they've done on purpose. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. You ever met any Christians that aren't judgmental? <laughs> when they go out and they, they tell you about the Bible, or they try, they, oh, the first thing they do is accuse you of this and that and tell you, how, oh yeah, and you're not like me, and you're, you know. But that's not what Jesus did. That's not what the story is about. That's not the, what, how you're guided to talk to people. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. Of course, that's another reverence to his father, Jehovah. The word, the law that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. What is he speaking? The word of God. The word that I have spoken. The word of God. You got to get this for I have not spoken of myself, but the father, which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. So why are you worshiping Jesus Christ? And why aren't you therefore following Jesus Christ as your example, as you're supposed to? And how in the hell can you possibly go back to church on Sunday when the word Jehovah is never spoken? Never acknowledged when Christ is hanging dead on a cross. Because you're not celebrating the life, you're celebrating the death. Which means you're celebrating the life of the Antichrist, the Pope, the replacement. Man as God. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now, when life everlasting... Again, do not confuse that term with this transhumanist nonsense that you're seeing now. No, life everlasting. That is a reference to not losing your spirit to the legal realm. Not going under contract. Not incorporating. It does not mean that you're going to continue after this life. Now, I'm not saying that's not going to happen. You can believe whatever the hell you want. I'm saying afterlife is not in the Bible. Okay, It's not a word you find in the Bible. So when he says that life everlasting, he's speaking of life right now, living eternally, that is without man-made time, without man-made space. Living in the now, living in nature, living under its law. Because remember, personhood, the legal realm, requires a spiritual death. In John 8, 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. What is the light? The law. I am the law of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. What's he commanding you to do? Well, to worship him. And to follow. Follow me. Follow the law. It's not difficult to understand the metaphor here, the allegory. The anthropomorphization, you'll have the light of life. Now, <laughs> if you don't understand that, I, I mean, again, I'm kind of like at a loss here that I can't express what that means. The light of life, right? I mean, it's, uh, yeah, let's go on. The 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 4, 10, 15, and uh, 15 through 18 Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, which is the entire legal realm, and personhood, and government, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, which is exactly what Christianity does, 
but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What is God? Truth. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, that is the secular world of man, man as God, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, don't ever worship images, should shine unto them, always bearing about in the body and dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. <laughs> what do you think that means, folks? Do you have a corpse in your own body? No. Manifest. What, what does it mean to manifest something? If you're manifesting Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is defined as Jehovah is salvation, and Jesus Christ is Logos, the personification of the law of God, well, then what is should be manifesting in your body? Your body is to be the vessel of the law of God. I don't think you understand. Again, we are at war. We are at a spiritual war against principalities. I don't think you understand the only way to overcome legal law is to manifest God's law in our body, to manifest Jesus, to follow Christ. I don't think you get it. I really don't. I don't think this is clear to people because of religion. For all things are for Jehovah's sake. For your sake, it says. All things are for Jehovah's sake. All things. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many renown to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. Oh, yeah, right. We all faint, don't we? Because people make fun of you, right? People don't want to hear what, what this is actually saying. Because then they'd have to be responsible for themselves. And that's really what it boils down to. They'd have to become an actual vessel of God instead of a commercial vessel for the state and church. But through our outward man, referring to the legal persona, we perish. Yet the inward man, the spirit, the soul, is renewed day by day. So yes, you, it's telling you to die. It's telling you to, as a legal person, to take off that mask, that persona, and die so the inward man may live and be renewed, be born again into nature and its law. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Okay, time is temporal. What time represents in reality is eternal, eternity. But if you're stuck in time that's created by man, a series of events on a timeline, then you're not living eternally, are you? But Clint, how do we keep track of this and that or that? I don't know. I don't know. How did they do it before? Year zero, as they say. <laughs> this fake created year zero. How? Well, gee, I hate to tell you this, but they looked at the frickin' sun. <laughs> they had all kinds of tricks that didn't require time. And again, don't confuse what I'm saying here that time is evil or time is... I'm saying man-made time. And again, it's not so much that man-made time in and of itself as a standing entity is a bad thing. The way we use it is bad. The way that it is the life of a contract is what is bad. That means you're not living eternally, you're living by time. And I don't know, again, it's one of those things, if you either get it or you don't. And if you don't get it, I, I just, I don't know how else to, I, 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 you're going to have to figure it out for yourself. I wrote about time. It's one of the four pillars of fiction, I believe is what I called it. You, you can find that post on my blog. It's an in-depth look at time and how it works, and the different timelines, why the Jews have a different timeline, why there's several different timelines going on. This is not the year... 2020 for most people out, for a lot of people out there. 
Freedom is abeyance of law, word of God, as exemplified by the story of Christ. Through Christ, that is through the law of nature, the Jehovah, that which emanates from Jehovah, the law of and over all that is self-existent truth is what will save our souls, our spirits, right? doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven or not go to hell. It means that you're actually acting by your spirit. Your spirit is not sitting there dead inside your body, which makes you depressed and want to kill yourself. Why do you think so many people are doing it? Why do you think there's so many drugs out there? Because our spirits are dead. That's what legalism requires. And I'm not saying that in any way that is colloquial or metaphoric in this case. No, I mean, seriously, you cannot have spirit. You cannot have your own spirit because you're not self-governing. You must obey the legal law. That's why freedom, true freedom, is to obey the law of God. But if you're obeying the law of man, law of the state, legal law, well then, you're not free. You're killing your own spirit. You're allowing your spirit to be stuffed into a corner somewhere, barely accessible, except on Sundays and holidays. <laughs> you're, you're completely devoid of spirit. And that's why they teach you in religion that the spirit is something you only have to be concerned with after your life because, oh my God, everything you do should be to go to heaven and that means follow the doctrine of the church or you'll go to hell. Well, that's, that's just all, none of that even makes sense. I mean, it's just, it's such crap. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wake the hell up. There's nothing spiritual about that. Yet we have been brainwashed by the religions and false doctrines of controlling men to the point that we don't even recognize our own soul, the spirit that is the cornerstone of free will. It is our spirit that drives us, not the mind and body. Take a wild horse as an example, right? You, the, the horse knows how to exist without man. And the only way to do what they call breaking the spirit of the horse is to completely take it out of its own nature. Put blinders on it, put a harness on it, which in our case is more of a figurative notion, and employ it. Start using it for your own will. The only difference is that they, <laughs> they treat us as if we're a little bit higher than the animal kingdom. That's it. That's the only difference. So we don't even recognize our own spirit, our own soul. Because if we did, then we'd start questioning things. We'd question the state. We'd question religion. We'd question the law because we know it's opposed. We'd read the Bible and we'd understand the Bible. It is our spirit that drives us, not the mind and body. To be saved, we must control our own mind and body. To do this, we must have soul. We must have spirit. Because that is the spirit to say no that is everything. The soul is principle over all else, meaning that the mind and body are subject to the spirit. Without spirit, without soul, the mind and body can be corrupted and thus governed by the false legalism of men, by wholly unnatural forces. Now, I understand, folks. I'm right there with you again. We feel, anyway, that we are forced into this system. Our parents did it for us. We had no idea of what we were getting into. We get to the age of consent. We consent. We continue to act in person, having no idea what we're doing until much later in life, after we've had 10 to 15 years of study and we finally understand what the fuck personhood is. Because we finally understand why we feel so bad, why everything seems like a prison, and it is an open-air debtor's prison. That's what <laughs> the district is, right? W w w I understand that it feels like we were put into this, but you have to understand that you can leave at any time. I understand that, and I don't leave because I keep doing this. I keep staying in because I want people to understand this because it's going to do me no good. It's going to do me absolutely no good to disconnect from everything and watch the soulless masses, the zombies of the legal realm, from afar. They'll probably come out and kill me. We need 
people. We need volunteers. <laughs> we need people who actually want to break free. The Bible talks about them, says there'll be very few, and I completely concur with that. Very few people will do it. I hope to be one of them. I hope I have the bravery. I hope I have the spirit left in me that it hasn't been drugged out of me or vaccinated out of me. The soul is principle over all else, meaning the mind and body are subject to the spirit. Without spirit, without soul, the mind and body can be corrupted and thus governed by the false legalism of men, by wholly unnatural forces. Our spirit is what completes us, keeps us from danger. Remember, danger is defined as jurisdiction. And guides our mind away from empty logic and artful thinking from the mere reptilian fight-or-flight responses of the animal kingdom. The soul is not separate from our body. It is the very spirit and substance of life. The spirit, the soul, is the energizer battery in the fluffy bunny. Without it, the body has no power, no self-control, and therefore no real self-existence. Your goal is self-existence, not needing any artificial thing to exist. That includes money. That includes food additives. That includes chemicals. That includes all these things. What is your purpose in life? To remain pure. To stay pure. That is the goal. So let's see how this word soul is actually defined. Again, going back to Webster's 1828. What is the soul? The soul is the spiritual, rational, and immortal substance of man, which distinguishes him from brutes, that part of man which enables him to think and reason, and which renders him a subject of moral government. Legal government is not moral government. Government means mind control, remember? To govern the mentis, the mind, gouverneur, mentis, government, govern the mind. Moral government, that's what the soul allows. Just that first sentence is incredible. The spiritual, rational, and immortal substance in a man. Remember, by saying that the soul is immortal, it means it's not attached to the body, to the mind. The mind and the body are physical entities, chemical reactions. The soul, the spirit is what controls it, allows you to be subject to your own moral mind control. That's why I say the spirit is the highest. And that's why we're to worship Jehovah as a spirit, as the Bible says. The spirit behind all life, all existence. The immortality of the soul is a fundamental article of the Christian system. Such is the nature of the human soul that it must have a God, an object of supreme affection. The understanding, the intellectual principle is another term that we can put on soul. The understanding and the intellectual principle. Now you attribute that usually, or you've been trained to attribute that to the mind. No. What you come away with after your mind, which is like a machine, a mortal machine that can be damaged and even killed, destroyed, when you have understanding of something, that's your spirit. When you intellectually consider things, that's your spirit. Yes, your mind is operating, but the spirit is what's happening. And you decide whether you want to act spiritually or not spiritually. You decide, because of the causality coming from this system, you decide how to utilize the mind. Do we bury the spirit and let the mind take over so that we're purely in logic like certain people we know, or <laughs> do we use our spirit and ability to understand things in their true essence? The eyes of our soul then only begin to see when our bodily eye is closing. So here he refers to a poem. The eyes of our soul then only begin to see when our bodily eyes are closing. And so a lot of times when the Bible metaphorically speaks about seeing or hearing, of course, it's not talking about your actual ears or your actual eyes. It's talking about your spirit. That which is completely illegal. <laughs> they don't want you to have spirit. They want you to think legally, artificially, not naturally, not spiritually. 
vital principle. Right? As we say, the principles of law are, are the vital principles of the Bible. Thou son of this great world, both eye and soul, uh, spirit, essence, the chief part. So again, here's the soul, and here's the definition of spirit. The essence, the chief part. As charity, the soul of all the virtues. Emotion is the soul of eloquence. But soul is also life. Right? So all those times the Bible talks about life and the light of life, etc., you, you got to consider that's the so, that's the spirit, right? It's not afterlife. It's not death that you will be in the form of your soul. It's all the time. It's eternal. It's life itself. So the notion that the church expresses to you that it needs to control your soul in order to have it go to heaven which by the way is a fairly it's a it's a it's a modern expression really the puritans i believe it was that uh, that would justify anything in this life in order to reach heaven in the next life and to reach heaven you had to be profitable and have gains and all these things that are against the bible but that's a whole other study but i really want you to understand there's Two different definitions. They sound very different, but in fact, they're the same. Spirit, the essence, life. They're the same. You're not alive right now, folks. You're not being part of life. In other words, nature. You're part of something artificial, banned from being part of life, banned from having essence and spirit of your own, banned from self-governing, all because you're a volunteer in the legal system. Life or the animation, the principle or part as the commander is the soul of an army, right? The army obeys the commander. The commander, therefore, is the soul of the army. The army is the brain and the, and the body. The brain doesn't need soul or spirit to carry out an order of the commander or, for that matter, a principle. An agent doesn't need his soul to do the, the bidding of his state, his principle. It is also referred to as internal power. Now, <laughs> remember the legal law is purely external. It bans or frowns upon anything internal and focuses just on the external. Now remember the moral spiritual law is internal. They don't want that. There is some soul of goodness in things evil. Well, you know, think about that for a moment. <laughs> Because to be evil, you really have to understand good. You have to know what good is, and that's pretty much where we're all at. We know what is good and right, and yet we don't do it. We don't uh, stop the bad from happening. We don't stop evil things because it's against the law. We can't act with internal power, with life, with vital principle, with spirit, with essence. It's illegal. Now, a soul or a spirit is also a reference to a human being or a person. So, in other words... When it's talking of the soul in this way, it's more S-O-L-E, but it's talking about an individual. Because remember, a person is an individual, and therefore we'd say there's not a soul present, right? But that doesn't refer to the actual soul of the man. It refers to the body. And so we have to distinguish between those two concepts. In Paris, there are more than 700,000 souls. Well, remember... Legalism is commerce in the souls. In other words, like cattle ranching, we're counted by the head without the soul. So they extract the soul. <laughs> That's the whole point. London, Westminster, Southwark, and the suburbs are said to contain 1,200,000 souls. Animal life. Now again, I defined animal in my book. And it's very important to understand that animal means without soul. Or in other words, an absence of anima, absence of animation or life, the, the essence, right? The spirit. That's what that means. Animal life, why we say that animals have no soul, is a reference to exactly what we are as legal persons. Life without soul. Animal life. Soulless life. When you put A-L on, on any word, it... It negates whatever the word is. And the word is anima. That is life, animal 
or soulless life. It's very important to understand that. It's why they refer to you as animals. It's why they refer to you as man and other animals in the law. You look it up. <laughs> Just type that into the legal system. That's, again, in my book. But the point is, if you're considered as animal life, well, then you don't have a soul. You're not acting according to your own spirit. That's the point. That's why it's defined here. The soul is defined as animal life. And another way to say that is to understand that this concept, even though it's not true, animals, of course, do have a spirit. It's not the point. The point is to say that animals don't have necessarily choice. They don't have necessarily this concept of free will because nothing in an animal's existence deals with fiction. Except, of course, that's what is created by man, which interferes with the nature and their place in it, and even our place in it. The problem here is that we've confused the notion of animals having no soul with animals not controlling themselves, self-governing, you know, through their soul. This is why the rabbits will overpopulate, then the wolves will overpopulate because they eat the rabbits, and then the, the wolves will die because there's not enough rabbits, etc., etc., etc. This is the natural course of things. This is the way it's actually supposed to be. But with man, man has this spirit of ingenuity and of all these different things, and he can either use that to love, uh, to cause love from nature, or to cause fear from nature, as we said. So the notion of being soulless is why they refer to us as beasts of burden, animals, four-legged creatures, dogs. And that's why they say English is the language of dogs or dog Latin. It's the illiterate language, the language without spirit, in other words. The Latin grammar set to English, set to the English language. So, yeah, that's, again, it's all in my book, and it's very important to understand that when you're reading the law, it does say man or other animals. They call it M-O, uh, M-O-O-A, the MUA laws, and, and you'd be surprised how many times it says that in U.S. code, man or other animals. Other animals, that, of course, means that they're considering us as soulless beasts, and it's very important to understand that this is why we are in this system in the first place, because we are not of the spirit. We are not using our own spirits. We're not self-governing. We are not being part of nature. And, of course, they trick us into their system, which causes that, and they never educate us any other way. So it's a brilliant system. you got to give it to these uh, creators of fiction, these Elohim, these gods <laughs> of the legal fiction. So to be clear, the notion that Christ did not come to judge, but to save. Now, I want you to really think about that. Because, you see, the Bible doesn't ever make real sense until you know the meanings of these names. Jesus Christ, right? It's logos. It's the law of God that will save it doesn't judge because it's the law. The judgment comes from breaking the law. So Christ, being the personification, the anthropomorphization of the law of God, the law of nature, was what will save us from all this stuff in the Bible it tells us not to do, which namely is called, collectively, the legal system. Persons, flattering titles, contracts, money, mammon, all of that stuff, we are saved from all of that by Christ, by the law of God, that which emanates from Jehovah. And remember, Jesus Christ, in the translation properly, means Jehovah is salvation. Remember, it's Yah, the short for Jehovah, Yeshua, Right? Christ's name, when pronounced in the form where you understand that Jehovah is in the name, as we saw last week in that documentary. And again, if you missed last week's show, you're going to be lost in this one, probably. And so the point is look, folks, there's only one thing that's going to save us. And you, individually, I should say, is, is more to the point. And that is when you start following God's law. But see, you cannot do that. 
And I stress this over and over and over because it's truth. It is self-evident that you cannot follow the law of nature, the law of God, while you're following the law of persons, the law of man. Contract, because you're under a different law, a law that is opposed in every way to the Bible law, to the law of God, which again is not man-made, it is self-evident. It is the essence of life. It is not something that needs to be written down, but it was, thank God. Because look how lost we actually are, even with the book. Even while reading the Bible, we're so lost because we have been tricked into misunderstanding and misinterpreting the words of that book. Thanks to dog Latin, thanks to English. We've been made into animals. Our spirit has been stolen. It's really amazing when you figure this out. The mystery is gone for me. Like I really, um, seriously, it, I have no qualms, no doubts about what's in the Bible. Yes, there are things that I still don't understand, but I don't take that as a problem. I take that as something to solve in the future. I'll understand it later. Right now, I don't need to understand it, but I will later. There's some mystery there that, that I've yet to uncover, and I will I, eventually. But the, the beautiful thing about it, and I stress this again, is that now that I've understood the Bible... I realize I don't have to act any certain way. In other words, I don't have to pretend to be anything or anyone. I don't have to pretend I have a title. I don't have to pretend I even have a name or a, so is at least a last name. I don't have to pretend <laughs> that any of this shit is real. And yet, while I'm in the legal system, as all of you are, I do. I have to pretend it's real. Hyper-reality, right? But I understand now that what is going to save me, <laughs> what Christians get all wrong in this modernity of weirdness that we call Christianity, is this notion of being saved, right? I believe this guy existed and therefore I'm saved. No, that's not, that's not at all what the Bible says in any way, shape, or form. And remember, words like believe they actually mean something very different than the English thing. Like, believe means actually doing and, and acting the part, right? If you believe in something, then you start doing it. And that's why it can be said that we all believe in the legal system because we're actually acting in it. We love it. Remember that notion that, you know, even if we hate it, we're still acting in it and therefore we're supporting it. We're showing it this belief, this love, because Leaf means love. Be leaf. Be in love. Understanding these terms, then we can understand that, yeah, Christianity has turned us into imbeciles, has taken this, this ignorance that we have of our own language, twisted it, and made us worship idols, made us do things or believe in things that are not even close to being in the Bible. I find it amazing. I really do. And I'm not judging here. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm just trying to knock you out of your trance, right? Just come out and, you know, as the Bible says, come out of her, come out of this Babylon system. I'm trying to save you. You know, I, <laughs> that's all I can say. And I, it's not because I'm telling you to follow me. I'm telling you to follow Christ, follow the law. And that's your choice. Again, we're back to free will, right? It's your choice. But at least now, after hearing this, you understand that this is voluntary. At least I hope you do. Because if you still think that this isn't voluntary, well, then you're hopeless. I mean, really, it's hopeless for you if you don't think everything you do in life is voluntary. I don't care what nation or country you're in. If you're not fighting for what you believe in, if you're not willing to die for what you know is right, for nature itself, for God, well, then you are voluntarily doing so. And you say again, oh, but there's a gun in my head. Okay, why is that stopping you? Get shot. Because I never hear about the gun actually going off. 
Very seldom do I hear it, right? And that's usually because someone did something really stupid. But you see, I know that most people will not do anything. Or you'll get mixed up in this rioting, you know, begging your gods to give you more stuff, basically. Rioting in the streets. It's useless. It's pointless. Because, again, it supports the fact that that system exists. It, it shows how much hatred you have, which turns out to be love, or that is belief. You believe in the system, and that's obvious because you're fighting against it, and therefore you're in it. You're allowing it to affect your reality. And not just your reality, but reality itself. Self-existence. So again, it's your problem. It's your fault. It's your judgment. It's your hypocrisy. It is your choice, just like it is mine. And I'm right in here with you. You know, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not judging. You know, I'd have to judge myself if I did. But I want to know. Do you want to know the truth? Or do you just want to keep ignoring it? I mean, that's ultimately the question. Because how long can you ignore that which sustains you? How long can you ignore that which is going to come back and bite you on the ass eventually? I just, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But it seems like the end... Or the answer is coming pretty soon to a neighborhood near you. Time will tell. Well, I guess eternity will tell. All right. So soulless life is really what that's saying. Life without spirit. And if you think, of course, about an animal, it's not so much that they don't have a soul. It's the notion that they have sort of this natural, instinctive kind of life. The fight-or-flight type of response of the brain. They're not sitting there thinking of poetry. They're not sitting there trying to define things. They're not, right? There's no choice. There's life and death. There's predator and prey. There's no other, you know, thing getting in their way, again, except man. Uh, active power, uh, another definition of soul. And that's why I say, you see, what has been taken from us? Our power. Well, where does the power come from? Most people would say the mind, the power of the mind. And yes, the power of the mind is great, but great can mean good or bad. You know, destructive things, right? The power of great men, the power of that bomb was great. Yeah, well, so active power, and, and specifically active power, meaning I'm choosing, I'm acting, I'm actually doing something. See, this is what has been taken away from us, and that's why they call it mind control, because it's not soul control, it's not spirit control, because you have to cut the spirit away. You have to cut the active power away from the brain in order to control the body. So the spirit is false. And this is kind of what they mean by Antichrist spirit. The Antichrist spirit is that which takes away your soul, your spirit. But if you go with Christianity, you don't consider the soul that way. But in all of history, in all of language, this is how we use the word. What is number 10? Spirit, courage, fire, grandeur of mind. So if you control that fire, that spirit behind the mind, then you can make the body do anything. And that's our problem. That's where we're at. Generosity, nobleness of mind. And that's referring to true nobleness, not the flattering title of being a noble or a royal, as they call it, this artificial fake thing that we again believe in whether we love it or hate it we're supporting it an intelligent being your heart or your affection is also a reference to the soul and it's interesting because i used to use the word heart until i realized yeah the heart is a, a vulgar sort of thing even in the bible it says don't use your heart use your your mind that's controlled by your spirit it's, it's interesting, I um, believe I put that in the book too, but uh, yeah, the heart 
is not the source of reason. <laughs> it's the source of affection, attraction, and all of those things. What you think is beautiful, what you think. But the spirit, when referring to the heart, should not be considered the same thing as necessarily the spiritual, rational, immortal substance of man. The heart needs to be controlled just like the mind, I guess is the best way to put it. Because love can lead to murder. Because love and hate are so interlinked <laughs> that, that you go from one to the other. And that's because it's not true love uh, when we're talking about the attraction between the sexes. It's not true love. There's never love of a true source when it comes to that. The love is in a completely different place than the heart, than the sexual organs. That's a spiritual type of love that you have to have for everything, not just one man or woman, but all men and women. Even your enemies. Because if you don't have that love for your enemies, there's no point. There's no point in trying to save anybody. In scripture, appetite, the full soul, the hungry soul, a familiar compilation of a person, but often expressing some qualities of the mind, like, oh, that poor soul, or, oh, he was a good soul. And, you know, again, she has spirit. Oh, boy, he had spirit. That ball player has spirit, etc., etc., etc. So there's so many meanings to these words. And when we use it in reference to a person a fiction, right? Again, expressing some quality of the mind. So it's kind of a reference to the man behind the person. Because again, it's the person that goes to jail and the man only goes because he's surety and has to pay for the person's crimes. Even though there really is no crime because it's all fiction. Now my little note here says, uh, do not confuse what is written here about the soul being a person. Every cow on a rancher's farm is also a soul, as a non-human thing, property, that is. Persons are referred to as souls for accounting purposes, not as actual self-aware beings. Slavery, and indeed our current prison labor system, has been nicknamed a commerce in souls, which I think is a brilliant name for it, referring to the use of men for free or cheap labor despite without need of their spirit, their choice. They do choose, right? Their choice, however, is a causality. It's either a cold, hard sell with 10 minutes of free time every day or go to the shop, make some cheap shit, sell it to government at really cheap prices, make license plates, right? Do something besides sit in this lifeless cell. Well, what would you choose? Right? You'd probably choose to, you know, if you had the choice, the causal choice, you'd probably choose that after a while because you'd, how long can you sit in a cell without doing something and feeling important and needed? So, again, a good example of causality. It's not choice. It's not free will. It's free choice. But that's franchise choice. And in a franchise like citizenship, and especially if you're in prison, you only have set choices you do not have the choice to say no you get two choices and either one means you're a prisoner or a debtor or both their choice is to rot in a cell or to work to pass the time once again we see the choice between two evils which is just causality this reference to a persona in legalism that is fiction reflects the body of man without total control over his mind and spirit, he that follows the legal law of man as an incorporate body. The use of persona, mask, status, is not in reference to God's creation or its law, but rather as a civil aphorism used to count slaves, that is, men bound by legal titles, legal citizenship, persons, obligations to the false law of false gods or magistrates. A better term for the legal soul, uh, the artificial soul, would be the word soul, or as in corporation soul, S-O-L-E, meaning single or individual, or that which is considered as a single legal entity by the count of the head, that is what tax codes call as an individual person. When married, two persons become one incorporation, a joint or yoked, which means wed, person in law. They become a single person. 
right? Because it's not a real marriage. It's not a marriage between two living sentient beings. It's a marriage or an incorporation of two statuses into one, going from single to wed or married. These terms are terms of the legal art and do not exist in nature, having no self-evidence or self-existence therein, which is why they must be proven through artifice. Through what? Through identity, through license, right? Through signs and symbols, marks, words, numbers, and through consensual acceptance of their artificial existence. Ambiguity, remember, kills identity. Without identity, without saying I'm the same as that art over there, that fiction, there is no mask. There is no persona. There is no legal person. There is no citizen. There is no anything. There's no law. Only the law of God. There's only the negative, not the positive law of man. But this is very important. It's how I start my book with ambiguity. What is ambiguity? It means that you cannot be defined. It means that you only have a single name. My name is Clint. That is my God-given name. It is my Christian name. According to the law, it's called the Christian name. Whether you like that or you think you're an atheist or a Muslim or anything else, if you're in America, you have a Christian name, a God-given name. And why is it God-given? Because it's what your parents decided. The Richardson part on my last name comes uh, automatically. I don't even have to say it. It's the surname. It's the slave name. It's the property of the state. And of course, when you attach your Christian name, that which is real, to that which is fiction or legal, and you call it the last name, last means first in legal. Again, if I have a will, it's going to be my last will and testament, not the first one. If I need to exclude someone from my will, I need to make a new will. You're not going to go by the first will. They're going to go by the last will, and they go by the last name. That is your will. And that's why they put the last name first in most legal documents. Without identity, there is no persona. The soul is the ghost in the machine. You've heard that term before, right? The ghost in the machine. Well, yeah, it's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's the spirit of that which is flesh and blood. Just like Jehovah is the spirit of all life, all existence. So we come to the word spirit, again out of Webster's uh, 1828, from spiro to breathe, to blow. The primary sense is to rush or to drive. So again, we see the action of the spirit. In other words, that which is wholly, wholly missing from most of us, that moral compass and sense thereof that everything is wrong and we need to fix it. Turn it back towards nature's law, towards nature's flow. But we don't have that spirit. We don't have that rush. We don't, we don't have that drive over our own minds. That's the whole point. And this brings up, again, the point I'm trying to make here with language and the difference between modern language, a dumbed-down slave language called English, dog Latin, and these ancient terms that had a sort of poetic, beautiful, spiritual uh, uh, prose about them. You know, a movement of the breath of life is what the spirit is, right? These things, they must be understood in the intention that they were written. So when we're talking about the spirit, we're talking about life itself. Because if you think about when we're talking about spiritual death, we're not talking about physical death. We're talking about the mind and body not being controlled by the spirit. Why? Because the spirit has been taken away from you through the false law. This is why it's so important that we recognize what this legal system does. It literally removes the spirit, the combination that is the conspiracy, the wedding between church and state. And if you actually still believe the church and state aren't wed, then you've got some serious consideration to do, if not just to understand that the church has been incorporated just like you have, to where the legal law now restricts the church from actually having any political views or taking any kind of action against that which is immoral. If you don't think that the church has been legalized or 
if you will, Satanized, then I, I don't know what to tell you. If you can't see that for your own eyes, if you haven't researched the 501c3 or 3c and seen what that does to a church, well, you know, besides making it registered and taxable, just like you, I'm not sure what to tell you. But the important thing is to understand how language has changed into a literal sense or where the noun, the name, has been taken, like, for instance, the supreme being. That's a verb. Being is a verb. So we hear the word being, we think of a thing, right? We're not thinking about the spirit of the thing. We're thinking about the body. And that's the problem, is we're not thinking spiritually. We're not thinking about the life or the spirit behind things. All bodies have spirits and pneumatical parts within them. Animal excitement, or the effect of it. Life, ardor, fire, courage, elevation, or vehemence of mind. And so again, we see these examples. The troops attacked the enemy with great spirit. What was driving the troops? Their soul, their spirit. Because their spirit is misdirected, and they're ignoring God's law, and they're going and killing other men, and destroying nature in the process. The young man has the spirit of youth. Well, think about that one for a moment. Think about what we were when we were young compared to now, now that we're fully brainwashed, right? We had so much more spunk, so much more spirit when we were young. And that should be, the reason behind that is pretty obvious. The law, the legal law of man. It doesn't allow spirit. It only promotes causality, a choice between two evils. He speaks or acts with spirit. Spirits in the plural is used in nearly a like sense. The troops began to recover their spirits. So after the battle... Right After killing people, after being injured and watching your friends, your troop mates die, you've lost your spirit. Right? You don't want to do this anymore. Just because I say that soldiers are prostitutes because that's how they're defined doesn't mean I don't have empathy and sympathy for what they go through. It doesn't mean that I don't support the Veterans Administration. It doesn't mean that I don't think they deserve just as much and no more as everyone else. But I don't think they deserve anything special because they are prostitutes. What I think is a shame is that they believe they're being patriotic. They believe their spirits are their own when obviously they're being driven. Now, again, I don't support the troops because I don't support the war. And if you're going to tell me to support the troops because I'm supposed to support the war, no. I don't support troops because I don't support the war. Period. That bullshit saying that they use to get you to be falsely patriotic? No, I don't fall for it. Sorry. Don't support the war, but support the troops? How is that even possible? Basically, what that is saying, don't support the war, but support the troops, that's basically saying support a bunch of people who have no spirit of their own, who are going to follow orders to their death, or to the death of someone else. Why would I support that? Why would anybody in their right mind support that? And that's the problem, right? Nobody's in their right mind. Because their spirits are dead. What is their spirit? The vigor of intellect, their genius. What is a demon or a devil defined as? If you go look, it's evil genius. Bent towards evil. And that's so easy to accomplish when you remove the moral compass, the spirit. And control the mind, and therefore control the body. The noblest spirit or genius cannot deserve enough of mankind to pretend to the esteem of heroic virtue. Temper. What is your temper? What is your disposition of mind? Habitual or temporary? As a man of a generous spirit or of a revengeful spirit, the ornament of of a meek and quiet spirit. Let us go to the house of God in the spirit of prayer. Now, again, your temper, your disposition of mind. If we look at Christ, Christ was not calm. Christ was actually pretty pissed off because he was, um, you know, we have to consider Christ of the flesh. 
And that's another reason that we have to look at that verse again. We have to say, well, Christ wasn't here to judge because Christ is of the flesh. Only Jehovah judges. Christ, the law, doesn't judge. The law is there to save. And because Christ is supposed to be considered in the flesh, when you read about the law and follow it, we have to consider, yeah, Christ had a temper, so he turned over the tables of the money changers, because, yeah, they're practicing usury and mammon in the house of God. So, yeah, his disposition of mind was violent. And (laughs) I say right on, my dude, more people should be Christ-like. But instead, what are we? We're habitual, right? Our spirit is sort of put on hold and we're like a record player just scratching back and forth. Right? We do the same thing over and over expecting different results. That's Einstein considered a nuts, craziness, insanity. So obviously the spirit can be tainted. Revengeful spirit, right? You can have a generous spirit or a revengeful spirit. A giving spirit or a taking spirit. The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. But here's the big one. What is the spirit? The spirit is the soul of man. The intelligent, immaterial, and immortal part of human beings. Now, when it says in the Bible that we should worship Jehovah as a spirit, that's what it means. The intelligent, immaterial, immortal, or eternal part of the universe, of existence, of life itself, all life, including man. In Ecclesiastes, it says the spirit shall return to the God that gave it. Well, that could be taken two ways. That could be taken as the person, the false spirit, (laughs) or it can be taken as the real spirit, right? Depends on which reference to what are you referencing when you say God? You talking about Caesar or are you talking about Jehovah? Now, I find a certain comfort in that. Not that I'm going to have some afterlife or some conscious existence, more of an energy transfer, not anything that man has thought of or capitulated to as their form of afterlife, their form of reincarnation or whatever. No, just that the spirit returns to God is a beautiful, beautiful metaphor, a beautiful concept, something I can't understand and I don't claim to understand. I'm not concerned with that because Jesus came to save us here, not after we die. Jesus saves men. I can't follow Christ after I'm dead. So to worship Christ is pointless. I must worship all of God, all of nature, all of Jehovah as one and understand that eventually when my spirit is done with this flesh and blood, with my mind and my body, that I will return to whatever that is. Now, again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what that is. The Bible doesn't really tell you either because, hey, these guys, when they wrote this, they didn't know. They get their best guess, right? But they don't know because that is one of the mysteries of the universe that we are not supposed to know. And you're going to hear all kinds of people telling them, oh, I had this past life or future life experience, da, 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 da. Oh, I died, I went to heaven, and then I came back. All of these different things that people say because they're having a a DMT, the real thing, tripping out in their head because they're dying and that's what the body does, you know, to allow you to pass, right? All There's so many people who have had so many similar experiences and the logical mind will say, well, that's because they're, uh, they're going to hell. They're all going to the same place or they're right. No, no. It's what happens when you die. Now, whatever they experienced or they think they experienced, whatever they dreamed, you know, that's great, wonderful, good for you. But the mystery of whatever that was is unknown. And a rational man will always admit what he does not know and what he probably will never know and what he probably should not know. That's, I think, one of the most important parts of the moral compass. An immaterial intelligent substance. Spirit is a substance in which thinking, knowing, doubting, and a power of moving do subsist. 
Now, again, this is that which is controlling the mind. It's very important to understand. An immaterial, intelligent being by which he went and preached the spirit in prison. God is a spirit. John 4.23, as we've been saying. Turn of mind, temper, occasions, state of mind. God is a spirit. Why does it say no false gods? <laughs> well, every god that you worship, including the pope, the king, the president, the mayors, the judges, the magistrates, right? All of them are not spirits. There's only one eternal spirit of the universe. And you must worship God as a spirit. I don't know if I'm making that clear. Uh, I'm trying my best using a vulgar language, you know, but uh, the spirit is your state of mind. What is your state of mind? Are you going to get up tomorrow, go to work, you make some mammon, make some currency, make some legal tender? Or are you going to get up and see life in a new way, see nature and its reality and cry for its demise? What are you going to do? You're going to ignore what's happening or you're going to do something about it. And I'm betting that most of you will get up and go to work because you have no spirit. I mean, what else can I say? Powers of the mind distinct from the body. So again, we're separating the body as one part of the trinity of man, the triune sort of power of man. You have the mind... And you have the power of the mind, right? So when it's referring to the spirit of the mind or the power of the mind, that is a reference to who's controlling that power. That is a reference to, is it moral power or legal power? Is it lawful? Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it being used for good or, or evil? That's the power. As it said before, it's the fire, the courage, the ardor, the genius, the intellect, the temper, the disposition of mind. What is driving? What is your mind plugged into? What is it that you are doing that gives you that power of mind? That power is the spirit. An empty mind, a mind devoid of spirit, is a slave. Because it's a man and a mind devoid of power. And yet the body can be made to do so much that it feels like there's power, but the power is surrogate. It's evil. Sentiment, your perception. Right? How are you perceiving these concrete jungles? How are you perceiving these corporations? How are you perceiving persons and flattering titles? You think it's normal. You think, well, everybody has one and everybody's doing it, therefore I'm going to do it. You think, I can't get benefits. How do I take care of my, how do I make money without, how do I do this? How do I do this? See, this is your sentiment, your perception. In other words, it's your spirit. And it's been completely transformed, brainwashed into supporting fiction. You think you can't live without that which doesn't actually exist. You think somehow nature can't exist without money behind it, right? Right? You think somehow you can't get food without money. You think somehow you can't live without money. Man, do they have you. Man, they have us all. They have completely caused us to actually have the perception that money literally grows on trees, that money is part of nature, part of our false nature. It's amazing when you think about how controlled we are in that sense, how far removed from our spirit we are. Eager desire, disposition of mind, excited and directed to a particular object. Well, what are you excited and directed to? Money. In all cases, fucking money. Money, 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 money. It's a crime. Funny, they're giving none away when you say you need it. Good old Pink Floyd. A person of activity, a man of life, vigor, or enterprise. Now, again, you have to be careful with those words because we know what enterprise means in the legal realm. But again, it's referring to life. And life, the time of a contract, the span, the space of a contract, is the life of it. And so it's the life of a person 
but this is referring to a man of life, which really means a man of spirit or a man of God. Persons distinguished by the qualities of the mind. We read that earlier. So again, you're acknowledging the persona, the identity, but considering the mind behind it, in other words. Excitement of the mind, animation again. So instead of being animal, you're animated. Cheerfulness. Life or strength of resemblance. Essential qualities is to set off the face in its true spirit. The copy has not the spirit of the original. Let's go to that one again. The copy has not the spirit of the original. You know what that's referencing? Everything. Everything. That's every symbol, every sign, every word. The copy has not the spirit of the original. In other words, anything artificial, anything that's art, technology, image, identity, the copy has not the spirit of the original. My driver's license has no spirit. My social security number has no spirit. My title, my deed, my coat of arms, my whatever it is. There's no spirit. There's no spirit in anything man-made. Something eminently pure or refined is another definition. As someone asked, basically, what's the meaning of life or what's the purpose of life? And that was my answer. Really, it's to stay pure, to pass all these tests, to get through this horrible thing that we're talking about and to ultimately come through pure. Now, we've all been stained. We've all been tainted by this legal system. Its names, its numbers, its titles, its marks. Doesn't mean we can't come out the other end pure. It's just we have to overcome this thing called causality. We have to understand it and then overcome it. And again, I'm sorry to say that most people will not. Not because they can't, but because they just don't want to. They would rather ride this ride until the end. And the end could come at any time because no one's actually maintaining the ride. Eventually, there's going to be a broken track and the roller coaster's going to freaking crash into the ground from 30 feet up. And we're all going to die. Because we'd rather take the ride, we'd rather ride the copy, than respect, love, and cherish the original. That's really what it boils down to. And again, this is just hypocrisy. It's just institutionalized hypocrisy. Hypocrisy means simulation. Simulation means hypocrisy. It is a way, it's an art form that allows us to ignore the original and focus on the art. The original be damned. Nature be damned. God be damned. So that we can be comfortable, have our little slice of the pie, and, you know... Be part of the system. The Matrix. Something eminently pure and refined. I like that. That's, that's, that's really, ultimately, if you're full of spirit, then that's what you're full of. Pureness and refinement. Knowledge, in other words. That which hath power or energy, the quality of any substance which manifests life, activity, or the power of strongly affecting other bodies, as a spirit of wine or of any liquor. Spirits, right? So again, this is a reference to the power. Now, you can have the most powerful intellectual mind in the universe, but if you don't have spirit, if you don't have control, if you don't have choice of what you do with that mind, well, that pretty much describes all scientists who are creating things on the behalf of corporations, who then patent that thing so nobody can use it, cures for cancer, cures for disease. All these people working for these artificial constructs are brilliant minds, in at least that functionality. Their spirits are dead. They're working for money. Not because they want to cure cancer. They're working for money. And that is the ultimate understanding of how the spirit is dead because you're not actually working to help people you're using that as an excuse to make money and i you know i'll tell you a lot of people a lot of people would not be doctors would not be scientists would not do anything 
if they weren't making more money than the average Joe Blow, right? They consider it by the prestige, which means delusion, trickery, illusion. They want to go to Yale or Harvard because it's prestigious. And again, all that means is delusional. It means it's a big, fat fucking lie. It's not sincere. It's not real. And then, of course, we come to an apparition or a ghost, which is why we started out saying the soul is the ghost in the machine. It's why the Holy Ghost is considered as part of God, because, again, we're talking about the spirit. We're supposed to worship the Holy Ghost. The renewed nature of man from the Bible, the influences of the Holy Spirit on man is what makes up our spirit. The renewed nature of man, the regeneration that is being born again into nature and its law. God, as we say, Jehovah. So here we have a full, incredible Look at what the soul, the spirit, actually is. We can no longer pretend that it's some unattainable, unreachable thing or something that's temporary, it's going to transfer, right? We can't think of it that way. And we certainly can't think of it in the after realm, the the heaven or the hell or the whatever thing you've been indoctrinated with. Your spirit is what drives you now, Not in the future, not in the past, now. What are you doing now? Well, that answer to that question depends on whether you have a spirit or not. Whether your soul is intact or not, or whether you've been brainwashed and enculturated to not have spirit. And I'm sorry to say that's most of you listening, probably all of you, including myself. Are we going to change that? Do we want to change that? Are we happy? Are we content with what's happening? I don't think any of you are. That's probably why you're listening to this damn show. So what a conundrum, huh? Everybody hates it, yet everybody loves it. We hate it, and we do nothing about it. We know it's wrong. We know the legal system is and always will be tainted. We know that it always results in democracy and then finally tyranny. We know that... We are in the wrong, that we are practicing art instead of reality. (laughs) And we know now, at least I hope you have come to understand, that we've been worshiping a false god this whole time. Whether we believe in God or not doesn't matter. Because if you don't believe in God, well, that God has to be defined somehow. So how can you not believe in something if it's not well defined? So what is it that you don't believe in? It's a very strange thing, right? And that's the problem with this belief system is that you believe in something that's been put forward by men, something artificial, a copy without an original, right? And then you have people that say, well, I don't believe that. And they're called anti this or anti that. It's funny because you could apply the same thing to how about abortion? Well, I'm pro-choice. And then there's pro-life. Well, the truth is they call you anti-abortion. Wait a minute. Anti-abortion, that would mean do something else. As if birth is not the first and foremost original natural state of being. As if the law of nature does not point to birth after having sex. What is it? that makes people demonize people who are so-called pro-life? And why is it that you allow these assholes to call themselves pro-choice when they're really pro-death? Because let's face it, if you're for abortion, you're for death. Why call it pro-life and how about anti-life? Doesn't make sense. See, they've demonized you for... Simply saying, no, this is nature's course, let it happen. Don't try to interrupt. Don't forcibly kill a life form just because it's not uh, external from the body. Now, I don't care if you're which side you say you're on. 
the truth is you're either on the side of God and nature or you're on the side of man's law. Because only man's law says it's legal and correct to have an abortion. God's law does not say that. I don't care what the circumstances are. You can use all kinds of excuses to justify anything. But in the end, there is no excuse to either not know the law or break the law. There is no excuse. And that's an extremely important maxim in both realms. So I refuse to say you're pro-choice. I say you're anti-life. You're going to call me pro-life. I'm going to call you anti-life. You're against life. You're opposed to life. You're opposed to new life. How about that? You see, it's it, it, the, the way that they phrase things causes you to be apathetic, to tolerate abortion. You're tolerating it. No, no, I'm fighting and I'm voting for officials who, who vote against it. And I'm, I'm spending money and I'm donating money and I'm doing all this with money. Therefore, I'm against it. No, you're for it because you're not doing anything about it. As long as you're apathetic, as long as you're tolerant, you're for it. Remember, for and against are the same word. Again, if you missed that in the last show, you're going to have to watch it or look up the word against or for. Can't remember which. The point is, you're not doing anything about it. You're in apathy. Remember the first quote that we said what is going to destroy our society what is destroying or has destroyed in my opinion our society our spirit apathy tolerance that is one thing that christ was not in any way shape or form was he tolerant when he saw something wrong he preached the law he wasn't tolerating the wrong he was trying to save the wrongdoer he wasn't judging them, but he also wasn't apathetic towards them. He didn't just accept it. And that is what we're supposed to follow. You're supposed to follow Christ's actions, the word of God, the law. You're supposed to be in action. You're supposed to have power over your own mind. But instead, you're a person. You're in the matrix and there's nothing you can do in the real world because you're bound by the fictional world. It's pretty amazing. Now again, do not be confused by this incomplete reference to John 4, 23 in the Bible where it states that God is a spirit. More accurately, God is the eternal spirit of all that is truth. Self-existence, right? Not the universe itself, not the physical bodies that make up the universe, but the spirit of that entire form and substance and everything, the spirit behind it. That is what we consider as, or that's what's supposed to be considered as Jehovah. Let us read the full verse for clarification. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God, that is Jehovah, is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, <laughs> I can't tell you how important it is to say, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth, because what is the truth? The truth is all of self-existence. All that exists is truth. But what is the spirit behind the truth that's what we're worshiping, right? What is the life? What animates that which is truth, that which is life? What is life? That is God. That is what we should be worshiping, cherishing, protecting. To worship God in spirit alone is idolatry, which is exactly what the false Christian church corporations as offshoots from the Vatican teach. Denominations. Right? Names of the same thing. They do not acknowledge God as all truth, and so do not instruct us in the law of an over-truth existence, right? That we may act truly and worship Jehovah both in spirit and in truth as the creator. 
In other words, we're taught to worship artificial things and to follow the artificial law of man over the law of truth. But there's also a very important meaning here that cannot be understood until you understand the legal system and personhood within it. The Bible is replete with this type of message. I'm going to read to you some of these verses. Now, I have these listed in my second book, so I'm going to again go to my draft and just read from there instead of searching throughout the Bible. Here's Romans 2, 5 through 15. The day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. All right, what does that mean? That means... Uh, yeah, they're not looking at your person. Oh, well, I have a badge. I have a, a license to kill. I have to, No, you do everything. Not your person, not your flattering title. You will be rendered. All your actions, all your deeds will be rendered upon you, your soul. Just because you have the excuse that your soul is taken, currently occupied by the state and it's guiding you to do bad things, that's no excuse. There is no excuse before God. That's the whole point. This is why you're to control yourself, self-govern. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man, upon every soul or spirit of man that doeth evil. The most important part of this is here. For there is no respect of persons with God. All right, so what does that mean? That means you cannot worship Jehovah. You certainly cannot follow Christ, which is the law of Jehovah, the law of nature, while in person. And from the perspective of the spirit of the universe, from this perspective of all that is truth, all that is self-existence, There is no respect of persons. That goes back to all your actions, all your deeds will be rendered to every individual man who does them. And if you do them while saying, well, I'm I'm Scott Free, God will forgive me because I'm doing so in person. Oh, I'm a soldier. I'm a police officer. I'm a corporate raider. I'm this. I'm this person. No, your deeds are your own. It doesn't matter what pretended title you put upon yourself. There is no respect of persons with God. I cannot tell you what an important lesson this is. More importantly, this is not even close to being the only incidence of this type of rhetoric in the Bible. Let's go to Peter 1, 17 through 18. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Remember fear? For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. How many of you are after silver and gold? Even though the Bible says that will not save you. (laughs) From your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers. How many of you are going to church just because your father or mother did? How many of you are going to these ridiculous places of false worship? Because, well, it's tradition. The Bible says don't take anything just because it's tradition. See, all these things that we do on a regular basis, on a daily uh, cycle, on a loop, a causal loop, is because our fathers did it, because our mothers say we should do it, because we listen to false preachers. (laughs) So in other words, the same people, our parents, God bless them, who put us into the birth certificate for all intents and purposes, who provided all the legal statistics and informed on us at our birth, who literally placed us and abandoned us to the state in personhood. Those are the people who tell us to go to church in the tradition of them and be a specific denomination or name of a Catholic religion, essentially. I mean, it's, it's, why would you trust, and again, no offense to any parents, including my own, but why the hell would you trust your parents who put you into this legal matrix in the first place, why would you trust them to know what to do uh, for your own salvation, for your own righteousness? Why would you trust them to know anything about the Bible when they completely abandoned God's word when they put you in the birth certificate process? 
Again, ignorance is no excuse. I'm not judging, right? We don't want to judge our parents. We always forgive. Part of forgiveness, though, is not apathy and not tolerance, but to get the hell out of the system that they put you in. It's time for us to break with the tradition of our families in regards to legal things because they don't know any more than us. Their parents put them into this system, right? A slave is born a slave. So you have to forgive, of course. And again, this is not a judgment call. This is tradition. Tradition is a very dangerous thing when it leads you away from the law of nature, the law of God. This is not about blame, This is about salvation. This is about becoming a man of God, a son of God. That has nothing to do with the traditions of man, the traditions of religions, or the traditions of the state. James 2.1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. How much clearer can it get, folks? How can you respect fiction? How can you respect the titles of men when God doesn't? When nature itself does not respect persons. In other words, a lie. Because there is no such thing as a person. The only reason they exist is because we fictionally believe they are true. And we give them respect. We let them off the hook. Therefore, what happens? We are caused to be tolerant and be apathetic towards corporations, persons, as they thrash and destroy the earth towards men who call themselves persons under flattering titles. We let them go. We let them do whatever the hell they want. Why? Because they're persons. And we're not respecting the law of God. It's that simple, folks. For there is no respect of persons with God, Romans 2.11. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person. Neither let me give flattering titles unto any man, Job 32.21. But if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Against what? Against God's law. James 2.9. To have respect of persons is not good for a piece of bread that man will transgress. Transgress what? The law of God. Proverbs 28, 21. How much more do I have to say? How many times do I have to show you these instances in the Bible where it specifically says that persons are not of God, that are not of truth, they are not to be respected? But them that are without, let God judgeth. Therefore put away from amongst yourselves that wicked person. Don't be a person, folks. The person is what is causing you all your ills. It is causing you your apathy. It is causing you your false worship of false things. It is causing your tolerance. Why? Because the law says that persons must tolerate evil and must be apathetic towards evil. More specifically... It says you must respect persons. You must respect flattering titles. It goes completely 100% against the Bible, the law of God. And when I say it's the law of nature, again, it's the law of truth. No lies. What could be the highest law of truth but no freaking lies? No fictions that you're respecting is real. What could be more simple to understand. You see, the Bible's not that complicated when you understand these terms, but see, for most men out there, that's male or female, you're all men, for most of us, we don't know the difference between a person and a man. We don't understand the difference between our true self, our true nature, or that fictional status, that reputation, that person that's incorporated into the system. And that's why up here it says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Why aren't you content just being a man and specifically a man of God? Why is that not contenting to you? Is it because you you want all these benefits, all these privileges? that other men in other countries and nations don't have, even the bum on the street. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. You're part of the pyramid, remember? You're smack in the freaking middle of that pyramid of those who are tyrannical over the others. It's just there's so much above you that you don't see your own place 
in that pyramid of power and what you've become because of it. And so what does the Bible say again? It says, put away from yourselves that wicked person. Stop acting like you're something you're not. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shall not respect the person or the title of the poor, nor honor the person, that is entitlement, of the mighty. But in righteousness shall thou judge thy neighbor. How do you judge men? Uh, Remember, all men are created equal. It doesn't matter what title, what name, what persona, what entitlement they have, all men are created equal. Do not respect the power of a man who is defined as someone who has power over you because that definition means that is your God. That's the generic term God. If you don't understand that, you're not going to understand how in almost every person and flattering title that you deal with is your God. You go to DMV, guess what? That bitch behind the counter who looks at you in contempt, she's your God because you're giving her respect. That bastard who's your mayor, that jerk who's your police officer and loves to exact and extort from you, you're respecting it. You're respecting the badge, you're respecting the title, you're respecting the person. If everyone's equal, how can anyone extort from you? The only way they can do it is if you've accepted this wicked person. I mean, it's really clear. It's, well, go on because there's so many instances of this in the Bible that you cannot just ignore it or think it's something else. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. Proverbs 24, 23. Well, what do we do? We respect a person who calls himself a judge. We're being judged by men, not God. We have fear of men, not God, uh, not Jehovah. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked, to overthrow the righteous in judgment. All you people do all freaking day long is talk about all these bad, wicked persons. All these horrible people in government, all these horrible people in the Council on Foreign Relations, in the Grove, in all these different things. But you don't do it. You're apathetic. Why? Because you're still stuck in personhood. It's the law. You have to just let these motherfuckers do whatever the hell they want. That's the law of man. That's the law of persons. And that's why the Bible over and over says do not respect it. And ye masters do the same thing unto them for bearing threatening knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Ephesians 6, 9. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. James 2, 1. Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you, and that's Jehovah, not Jesus, Take heed and do it, for there is no equity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. 2 Chronicles 19.7 You know, I can go on, I can go on and on and on and on with these. But the point here is very clear. I don't even have to go on. It's right there in front of you. Every single minute of every single day, you are violating God's law with the respect of persons and flattering titles. There's no getting around this. There's no saying that this means something other than it does. But most importantly, what it's really trying to tell you is that you, under no circumstances, there's no way for you to worship Jehovah, worship nature, worship truth, and live in it if you're living in a lie. If you're living with respect of persons, both exterior and, and interior. In other words, you believe you're a person, and therefore your person is bound to other persons. You see, this is the problem. It's not holy. It is not sacred. These things are not of God, and therefore you cannot worship God. You cannot be a practitioner of the word of God, of Jesus Christ, you certainly <laughs> you certainly can't be a Christian in any real sense if you respect the persons of man. And guess what? 
Remember, a person is a corporation, and every religion that you follow is a corporation. Some of them are corporation souls, like the Mormon church, like the Catholic church. Some of them are just outright legal corporations that are completely bound by man's law, and they tell you to follow man's law, which includes respective persons. I don't know what to tell you, folks. If that's not clear to you, if this doesn't make you stop and consider what you've been fooled into doing, which is to go completely 100% against the Bible in every way possible by accepting personhood and therefore accepting a legal system, a law that is completely opposed to God because that's the law that affects the person and you're surety and bound to that person. I don't know what to tell you. If that is not clear to you at this point, You're lost. You're gone. You're already so spiritually dead that there is no coming back. But I hope, I hope, I pray that there's a few of you that understand what's being said here. I hope. I I don't say I hope very often, but my God, do I hope. I pray. If the universe is the body of Jehovah, the force that gives it life or being right? Supreme being as a verb is the spirit. So you could say that the universe is the noun and the spirit, Jehovah, is a verb, the action, the existence, the life, that which animates. And the law is the word, again, Christ or logos, that which emanates from the spirit. The truth of the living God, Jehovah, is the body, the creation. What we call creation, that is the body. You could say the law is the mind and the life is the spirit. The spirit is the eternal creator, the being of existence. Remember, Jehovah is a verb and so is the intention of this word spirit as applied to Jehovah as that which animates, that which gives life. The spirit controls and governs the body. As the creator is the spirit of creation. We cannot worship either the body, the creation, the truth, or the spirit, that which gives the body life or existence or animation. We cannot worship either separate from the other, lest each become an idol unto itself. So creation is not God, but God is also not just the creator because you're missing that which is created, that which It gives life. Nor can we allow our soul, our spirit, to be separated from our body, for this is the recipe for tyranny and legal oppression, otherwise understood as incorporation. Without the spirit behind truth, the truth is dead. The body is dead, spiritually, that is. Without the truth, the body, the spirit is without cause. Without creation, the spirit that is the creator is impotent. What good is a creator without creation? And the idea of eternity is sort of the point here, that the creator is not that which created one time in history, as the church likes to teach. Creation is eternal. Creation is life keeps happening eternally. And we should respect, honor, and cherish, and protect that cycle. But instead, we we worship <laughs> we worship a statue of a guy pinned on a cross. We worship the image of an allegory because that's what we've been told. That's what we've been taught by very very bad men, and often by men who have no clue or have never even thought to question what seminaries and theologists teach them. So there's a lot of sort of useful innocence, as Lenin said, right? The useful idiots. That's basically most priests. Well, I'll take the Vatican out of that statement, but uh, without the creator, without the spirit, creation is dead. That's why it says you must worship the spirit and the body or the spirit and the truth, the reality of things, the substance, not just the form, because that would be form without substance. Substance as defined is the spirit, right? The, the, The immortal sort of immaterial spirit. So the material and the immaterial are joined. It's part of that triune sort of notion. 
And the law, I guess you could say, is the mind, if you will. To truly be a man of Christ, a man of the law of God, of the word, of logos, is to worship the spirit of truth as God. The spirit behind truth. Right? Because otherwise, what is truth? Truth is just dead. Without the body, the spirit is <laughs> has no point. Nothing to control, nothing to animate. I hope this is making sense. I'm sure it's something you've probably never heard before, and yet it's so self-evident. Instead, corporate Christianity, that is legally sanctioned religion, has confounded the truth from the spirit separated them, incorporated <laughs> their own false truth, separated the creator from the creation, in other words, abused the truth despite the spirit and committed atrocities toward the truth that is us and all of nature in the false name of the spirit, the one that uh, they call God. For the name of God is hidden therein, and so too is the meaning of the name, Jehovah. Nothing could be more ludicrous and absent of reason than to worship the creator, the spirit, while completely destroying, poisoning, polluting, ignoring the body of creation, the truth, right? Reality, substance, and its law. Nothing is more ridiculous than taking a big old shit upon creation and then saying, I, I love God, I, I, I'm, and I love Christ, and I'm, I'm a Christian. And, I, you know, it, it, nothing drives me more crazy than this hypocrisy. And it's institutionalized. Again, it's simulation. Yes, we must worship the Spirit of God, but we must come to realize that living and respecting truth and its law is what that worship actually entails. To treat the body with love and respect is to worship the spirit of the body. For without the body, the spirit, the life is dead. Now for further clarification, just so you don't think this is just coming from Clint Richardson, that freak on the radio, coming live from his basement, we may read the Strong's Concordance entry for these terms, spirit and truth as used in the above uh, verses. And this is very telling. This is very, it, it's very beautiful to me. And I'm not doing this just to spout off, just to, I'm not in love with my own voice. I'm not here for any other purpose than to bring you the truth, to bring you the spirit, because it's been completely absent in your life. It's been absent in mine. I'm trying to recover my own. And to do so, I have to understand what is the spirit of truth and what is the truth of the spirit. I, I can't do it with all these man-made art forms. I must come to self-evident truth. So how does the King James Version, how does it translate these ancient terms, which had very different meanings than what we're told, how is truth, when it is used in the Bible, here it's 107 times, truly and true and verity is another word for truth. How is that word used? And especially when it says we must worship God in spirit and in truth. All right, well, let's start with truth. We must worship God objectively. What is true in any matter under consideration. So it means truly or in truth, according to truth, of a truth, in reality, in fact, right? Certainly. And when it says in fact, it means when the facts match reality. So in other words, there's really no use to have a fact because it's self-evident. What is true in things appertaining to God and the duties of man, moral and religious truth? In the greatest latitude, the true notions of God, which are open to human reason without his supernatural intervention. The truth as taught in the Christian religion, respecting God and the execution of his purposes through Christ, and respecting the duties of man, 
opposing alike to the superstitions of the Gentiles and the inventions of the Jews, and the corporate opinions and precepts of false teachers even among Christians. Yes, the corrupt opinions and precepts of false teachers even among Christians. Subjectively, truth as a personal excellence, that candor of mind, which is free from affection, pretense, simulation, that is hypocrisy, falsehood, and deceit. Well, think about that, folks. What is the cause, what is the source of all affection, pretense, simulation, falsehood, and deceit? The spiritual mind is free. The truthful mind is free from those things. What is the source? Man. There's no other source. There's no pretense in nature. There's no simulation in nature. It's real. You can't say a simulation is real. Falsehoods, deceits, those all come from man. In other words, Satan. The true meaning of the word, that which is adversarial to truth and spirit, nature. You see, again, we're taking the unnecessary mystery out of what the king's translators and others did to the original source, the, the original uh, Greek and uh, Latin, etc. Respecting God and the execution of his purposes through Christ. Now I want to go back to this because, again, if I am worshiping Christ, it means I'm respecting God and I'm ex- executing the law of God, which is his purpose. His purpose. What is the purpose of Jehovah? Existence. Life. Right? The continuation of spirit. So that's why we have Christ. That's why we have the example of the law of God. Respecting the duties. Well, what is a duty? That means there's a law. Opposing alike to the superstitions of the Gentiles and the Jews. The inventions of the Jews. Folks, basically what this is saying, and it says this a lot. By the way, if you're going to call me anti-Semitic for, for quoting these things, I don't know what to tell you because you're saying that the whole of all the concordances, all the lexicons, anything that actually defines the words of the Bible, especially the word Jew, which is that which is opposed to Christ, that which is opposed to, to the law of God, right? That, that's how it defines it, not me. I'm just the messenger. But you're going to say I'm anti-Semitic or I'm a Holocaust denier, right? All tricks uh, that they use to shut people up, and they've certainly done it to me. If you're going to say that, well, then you're stupid enough to believe that the Bible, the concordances of the Bible, and the lexicons, the reference to the the ancient words, that they are also anti-Semitic. Even though Jews aren't Semites... (laughs) That's a, there, because there is no such thing as a Jew, as we, you know, that was the show that they, they censored from YouTube. Jew is a description. It's like saying liar or cheat <laughs> or, you know, anything that describes a group of people. It's it's not a religion. It's, it's not, it's anti-religion. It's, I mean, God, I don't want to say more because I'll get censored. But this is what the Bible tells us. It tells us to oppose both, right? Because Gentiles are, are, are even worse because we believe the shit that the Jews come up with, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we believe in Hollywood movies as history. We believe in the news that comes out of, you know, we, we believe all this stuff. That's the point, right? So what it's trying to say is don't believe in anything but what the law is. Don't believe in anything but what truth is. Even the corrupt opinions and precepts of false teachers, even among Christians, that's including the Pope, right? That's including the Jesuits. That's including the Methodists. That's including the non-denominational whatever, the rock. Any church that is a corporation, essentially, any church uh, that is false, they're not going by the Bible. They have their own doctrine. In fact, what's interesting about a corporation's soul, especially when forming your own church, something I've considered actually, is that you have to state your own doctrine. So right away, you're instructed that you have to create a false doctrine, right? And so I, I imagine that the best way to say it is, hey, my doctrine is the correct 
understanding and translation of the Bible. And that way you can at least use the correct words when uh, being challenged according to the concordances, which are accepted. It's amazing because the Bible says, do not follow the traditions of your fathers if they are opposed to God and God's law. Right? The Gentiles. What is a Gentile, folks? You can look this up for yourself, even in Webster's. It's actually the meaning of person. (laughs) People, right? The, the, The lower case people, the common people are the Gentiles. Those who are, and this is what it means, those who are bound to the nations. This is why in the Bible it talks about, and we covered before, those who escape the nations and go back to God. You are a Gentile if you are part of a nation. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. Are you a Jew and a citizen of the United States? Well, then you're a Gentile. Are you a Muslim and a citizen of the United States? Well, then you're a Gentile. Don't think that that word is reserved for just, what, white people? I mean, are you that stupid that you would think that? I mean, Gentile, it has a specific meaning. It's the lowest class of common citizen to a nation. And that means that you're under the law and superstitions of people who are opposed to Christ. And you fall prey to the prestige and the inventions of the Jews, those who are anti-Christ. And I'm sorry, again, maybe you're Jewish, whatever that means to you, but what the concordance says and what the Bible says about the Jews are that they are the fallen. They're fallen Israelites. They're no longer the Israelites, right? They're the fallen. And that can be anybody, just like your prime minister once said. Anybody who says they're a Jew is a Jew, okay? And part of that, in fact, the big part of that is to deny Christ. Christ is not your Savior. Christ is not your Messiah. How can you say you're anything but anti-Christ? Because anti just means a replacement of or opposed to. So again, Jewish is voluntary, I guess is the point. Christianity is voluntary. Being a Jew is voluntary. It's not something you're born with. And neither is Christianity. But they did set it up that way so that you're born into what's called a Christian nation, which makes you a Gentile. In other words, the only way to actually be a man of God is to not be in a nation. That is what the Bible says. And that is what the definition of these words say. The only people that are true followers of Christ, true men of God, are those that are not bound by the nations. Not under the legal law. I don't know what to tell you. I think I've made a pretty good case here that says you cannot be in both realms. You cannot have your foot in the legal and be under God's law. It's impossible because you're respecting that which is not truth. Okay, so we have the definition of truth. What's the definition of spirit? Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit of God, Spirit of the Lord, my spirit, Spirit of truth, Spirit of Christ, human spirit, evil spirit, Spirit general, Jesus' own spirit, Jesus' own ghost, etc., etc. From G4154. Again, this is how we're supposed to worship Jehovah in spirit. This is the meaning. A current of air, uh, this is like the uh, etymology, current of air like breath again, right? Blast uh, or a breeze by analogy or figuratively a spirit. Again, figuratively. (laughs) So important. Human, the rational soul by implication, vital principle, mental disposition. Uh, Again, referencing how the word was used in scripture. And you can see there's it's referenced many different times. Spirit 111 times, Holy Ghost 89 times, Spirit of God 13, and then human 49 times, human spirit that is. You can use the word spirit, in other words, to describe almost anything. What's the spirit behind a lawnmower to cut grass? You know, alcohol is a spirit, etc., etc. Don't confuse those analogies or those figurative uses of the spirit with how you're supposed to consider the spirit of the Lord, of Jehovah. Superhuman, an angel, demon, divine God, uh, Christ spirit, the Holy Spirit, ghost, life, spiritually minded, etc. So now here we get into 
what it means to worship Jehovah in spirit, the third person of the triune God. And, you know, don't confuse what I'm saying about the triune man with the triune God, except to say that it is essentially an analogy uh, for the spirit of man and how important it is, the spirit, the body, and the mind. But we have to be able to understand that vulgar comparison so we can understand ourselves and how we are controlled. The third person, the triune God, the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. Remember, the Son, Jesus Christ, Son means law. In the Bible, it's capitalized, right? It means logos, in other words. Uh, it also means word. The word of God is the law of God, is the Son of God. Sometimes referred to in a way which emphasizes his, or his God's, personality and character, that is the Holy Spirit. Sometimes referred to in a way which emphasizes his work and power, the spirit of truth. You see how this works? Never referred to as a depersonalized force. Now, what does that mean? Never referred to as a depersonalized force. In other words, when they're allegorically or by analogy, figuratively saying that there are three persons of the triune God, which is, of course, a theism, a, a ridiculous notion because God, the Bible is against personhood, but it's using person in, the, in sort of a natural sense, if you will, allegorically, by analogy. The spirit is, and this is what I've been trying to tell you, the spirit is never referred to without the other two parts of the of the trinity or the triune god so in other words you shouldn't worship only the spirit right the spirit and the truth is what you're worshiping and so we should never say that something is separately divine or when the church speaks of this notion of the trinity which really isn't biblical in the way that they portray it because their idea is to of course separate the parts in order to make the pope God, or the vicar of Christ, the vicar of God, replacement, right? So this is all part of the Council of Nicaea and all that stuff. But biblically, what this is really saying, and I'm trying to say it in, in, in a different way, but there's really only one way to say it. We cannot separate the creation from the creator. We cannot take the truth and consider only the spirit. Because again, in the Bible, we're never referred to as a depersonalized force, the person that they say is the triune God, one God, the, you know, it's really hard to put this into terms because, again, it's English and, and we're trying to take meanings of words that no longer exist. So it's very difficult. But, okay, so the spirit, the vital principle by which the body is animated. All right. So again, to consider the universe without the spirit of the universe, the creation without the creator behind it, it's like basically saying God is a zombie or creation is a zombie. It has no spirit. And that's a big mistake. So you cannot say that animals don't have a spirit behind it because it's the spirit of God. That a rock doesn't have a spirit. It's a spirit. The water is what's, what animates the water, the spirit of God, Right? Everything has existence and animation, life, because of that spirit. So to separate them and make them depersonalized, in other words, split into separate gods or separate qualities, is bad. We must worship them in body and soul, spirit. The rational spirit, the power by which the human being feels, thinks, and decides, the soul. But wait a minute, you say, that's the mind. No. How you feel, think, and decide depends on your soul. What controls your mind? You understand? That's why you can be completely enthralled with baseball statistics, for God's sake. You can ignore anything that's real and focus on something completely false. You can be <laughs> you can be completely enthralled 
by Game of Thrones and the whole story behind it, even though you know it's a fiction. You're going to be completely enthralled and know every character and every statistic and everything behind Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever it is. And yet you can know nothing of truth. Nothing of the spirit behind the truth. Because your spirit is completely subdivided, taken away, and you're concentrating on fiction as if it's reality. Right? You're looking at what is the hyper real and saying it is the real. You're saying Disneyland is the real. When I go to Disneyland, it's the only time I really feel good. Really? <laughs> you fucking nuts going in the forest. Just get away from anything man-made and you'll feel freaking great. Again, the spirit is the soul. So tell me then, how can you think of the soul as what the church tells you it is? When it says right here, it's the rational spirit by which the human being feels, thinks, and decides. How can you think of the soul as that which detaches from the body after you die? And think of it as nothing else. You see, they don't want you to consider. They don't want you to understand how they've completely stripped you of your spirit, your free will. A spirit, a simple essence, devoid of all or at least all grosser matter, and possessed of the power of knowing, desiring, deciding, and, most importantly, acting on that power. Knowing, knowledge. Something we don't do because why? We have no spirit. <laughs> don't you get it? A life-giving spirit, the human soul that has left the body. A spirit higher than man but lower than God. Used of demons or evil spirits who were conceived as inhabiting the bodies of men. Right? Again, metaphorically. <laughs> the spiritual nature of Christ, higher than the highest angels and equal to God, the divine nature of Christ. The disposition or influence which fills and governs the soul of anyone. The disposition or influence which fills and governs the soul of anyone. That's the spirit. <laughs> what fills your soul? <laughs> what, what is your disposition? What is influencing you? I think the answer is probably one that you're not going to want to admit to. The efficient source of any power, affection, emotion, desire, etc. Now, what is that saying? Well, what is the source of your power? Is it God or is it the state? And therefore, what is the disposition of your power? What is that which is anti-power? What is anti-affection, anti-emotion, anti-desire? Well, it's the state, right? Because you could say the same thing that it's God. Because if you're following God's law, your desires go by the wayside. Your needs come first and the needs of others. That's the opposite of the legal system. A movement of air, a gentle blast. Again, that's reference to the uh, etymology of the word, the breath of life, for instance, uh, is, is what it really kind of refers to. And this brings up... Again, the point I'm trying to make here with language and the difference between modern language, a dumbed down slave language called English, dog Latin, and these ancient terms that had a sort of poetic, beautiful, spiritual uh, uh, prose about them. You know, a movement of the breath of life is what the spirit is, right? These things, they must be understood in the intention that they were written. So when we're talking about the spirit, we're talking about life itself. Because if you think about when we're talking about spiritual death, we're not talking about physical death. We're talking about the mind and body not being controlled by the spirit. Why? Because the spirit has been taken away from you through the false law. This is why it's so important that we recognize what this legal system does, it literally removes the spirit, the combination that is the conspiracy, the wedding between church and state. 
And if you actually still believe the church and state aren't wed, then you've got some serious consideration to do, if not just to understand that the church has been incorporated just like you have, to where the legal law now restricts the church from actually having any political views or taking any kind of action against that which is immoral. If you don't think that the church has been legalized or if you will, Satanized, then I I don't know what to tell you. If you can't see that for your own eyes, if you haven't researched the 501c3 or 3c and seen what that does to a church, well, you know, besides making it registered and taxable, just like you, I'm not sure what to tell you. But the important thing is to understand how language has changed into a literal sense or where the noun, the name, has been taken, like, for instance, the supreme being. That's a verb. Being is a verb. So we hear the word being, we think of a thing, right? We're not thinking about the spirit of the thing. We're thinking about the body. And that's the problem, is we're not thinking spiritually. We're not thinking about the life or the spirit behind things. And remember, what does the Bible say? You must worship God in spirit and in truth. There is the mind and body of every man, the mind able to think without taking action, and the body able to take action without thought. But the spirit, the soul, that breathes life into each of these. The spirit gives life to the mind and body, governing them at high or at low. The body is useless to Jehovah, to truth, to nature, without spiritual thought. The defeated spirit is the defeated, enslaved man, for there is no fire behind his thoughts. His thoughts do not come from the spirit, therefore his body is cowed into inaction, against evils, submission to evils, and therefore tolerance of evils. This perfectly describes the legal system of man's law and of personhood or agency therein. For the spirit can no longer be the principle of any man when the man has taken the state as his principle in agency, in bond and surety, where that man must follow the legal law of man over and above the law of God, the law of nature. And that, by the way, is despite the maxim of law that clearly states that if the law of God and the law of man are at variance, then the law of God is to be followed. But you see, remember that their law says the contract makes the law. And that's where the devil and his tool comes in, right? The contract, the attorney and the contract. This is the problem, is that all these maxims, they have various places or various hierarchies in the scale. And of course, that foundational one where... If the law of man and God are at variance, the law of God should be followed. The law of nature is very low. It's very foundational. And then there's this sort of transitional set of maxims that allow you to abandon the foundation, which is the contract makes the law. So obviously, if you're entering into contract, you're no longer under God's law. You cannot be for the law of the contract uh, doesn't allow you. It is impossible in every way to be a citizen of government and also a man or son of God. It is impossible in every way to act in legal persona under the legal law of persons and also follow the Christ example in worship of Jehovah, that is, truth. God is truth. Persons are lies, and no liar is a worshiper of truth, of God. No man that is tolerant of lies can obey the law, the logos, of truth, of God. Most importantly, what the soul or spirit is not is some external thing. There is no life without the spirit behind it. False religions teach that we should ignore our inner spirit so as to save our soul for heaven. This again is not a biblical commandment or teaching. Such instructions come from men in power and control, for to control the spirit is to control the mind and subsequently the body. We are educated and enculturated, socialized to resist resistance against evils, to tolerate bad men and allow them power and authority over us. If you are not familiar with this term, I assure you it is a very important part of the Catholic indoctrination 
process, the enculturation of the masses into false Christianity. Let me give you some examples here. And these links are active if you want to read in full the, uh, the articles I'm quoting from. As an African Christian, I can say that enculturation is not in conflict with globalization. Enculturation is not in conflict with globalization. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd say that's pretty true. Uh, that's from Enculturation in the Gospel, a Mozambican Perspective. Conceived as a continuation of his earlier work, City Temple Stage, 2004, this study addresses the enculturation in visual and material terms of Catholic sacraments and sacramentals into an Aztec worldview. Now, we talk about this a lot, the fact that so many cultures were literally enculturated into the so-called Christian, which at the time was really Catholic, worldview. Christian text for Aztecs, art and liturgy in colonial Mexico. This is still happening today, in, in other words. Themes of enculturation and dialogue with Islam conclude his survey. So again, enculturation of different uh, religions. Global Catholicism, diversity and change since the Vatican II. Mark Francis, superior of his order, advocated greater enculturation, meaning allowing worship to be shaped by the local cultures in which it is celebrated. Well, how can worship of truth be altered or shaped by the culture that you live in? Cult -ure. The cult that you live in, which we call society, America, how can you let that artificial structure, that construct, that matrix of culture, of enculturation, how can that possibly alter the truth? It can't. If your truth is your culture, then you are not in worship of truth. You're in worship of your own version of truth. And remember, Truth has no versions. There is one truth. That truth is nature. That is God. It is Jehovah. And we know the meaning of that word, so we don't have to think or be embarrassed to say it anymore. We don't have to be embarrassed to worship truth, because God is truth. If our God is truth, then we cannot, at the same time, shape our truth according to our culture. But this is the entire plan, the entire purpose of the evangelization coming from the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, etc. It is to enculturate you into a false religious sect. Nothing to do with truth. And the Bible has nothing to do with culture. It wants you to have nothing to do with culture if... It is at variance with God's law. And again, that's why I'm so attracted to the Bible. It's because you don't have to wear any clothes. I don't have to wear a tie. I don't have to comb my hair a certain way. I don't have to cut my hair. I don't have to do anything to satisfy any man. Only God. I only have to live in truth. To me, that's brilliant. I mean, I... I don't know. I don't need fashion. I don't need a, a ceremony. I don't need any of this enculturation. Again, that's Vatican policies. Enculturation dominate Jesuit talks on liturgy. Oh, gee, do you think? In any case, contemporary Orthodox and Catholics, unlike Protestants, recognize the success of this great work of enculturation which took place in the first six or seven centuries of the Christian era. What did they form? Not a true Christian following. No, they formed a corporation, a church, a false religion, and they enculturated people into it from all different types of cultures. And as it said above, they shaped that Christianity by the local culture. They took the pagans, for instance, and turned their pagan gods into Christian gods, that kind of thing. Differences between Catholics and Orthodox. 
Other paradigms documented are mediating salvation, quest for justice, evangelization, enculturation, etc. Classic texts in mission and world Christianity. I recommend David Power on the Word as a focal point for enculturation of the sacrament, Gordon Lathrop's pointed assessment of ecumenism and liturgy, and Felipe Barra's impassioned description of pastoral liturgy as a form of ecclesiology. Sacraments, revelation of the humanity of God, the humanity of God, engaging the fundamental theology of Louis Marie uh, Chevet, right? <laughs> revelation of the humanity of God, only a Catholic could possibly write that. I mean, <laughs> the humanity of God. Yes, a human created all things. Oh, uh, unless you consider Christ is God, well then, yeah, that's that's okay, because then the Pope can be God. So it's very important to reveal the humanity of God to a bunch of really ignorant men. And that's called enculturation. He pays particular attention to the affinities between teo, whoa, teoyoism, Mexico religion, and Catholicism in the use of metaphoric language and visual metaphor and the process of enculturation that underlie the missionary endeavors in 16th century Mexico. Again, here you have the Catholics going down and replacing one religion with their own because how else do you establish a new world order without a new world or one world religion? Christian texts for Aztecs, art and liturgy in colonial Mexico. Gerwin van Lee Wen, a Dutch missioner who promoted enculturation of liturgy in India, has died of cardiac arrest, etc. That's from Addenda. An entirely new chapter at the end of In 2000 is devoted to adaptations which are the competence of bishops and bishops' conferences, its final paragraphs spell out norms for enculturation, the adaptation of the Roman rite to different cultures. Liturgy, new emphasis on the sacred. Now, did you hear what that said? Spell out the norms for enculturation, the adaption of the Roman rite. What do you think each Christian religion is, folks? This is very much like the notion of free slavery. You're, you're not in chains. You're free to do whatever you want within the cage, within the borders of your master, the jurisdiction, right? You can take whichever job that will employ you, use you for your labor without spiritual guidance, without the spirit. This is very similar because they've given you variations of the same thing, which is Christianity created by the Roman rite and their councils. And here they're telling you outright that it's normal. There are normal ways to enculturate different societies, different cultures into the Roman rite, the, the, the Catholic church. And I'm sorry to tell you, are you a Methodist? Are you one of the church of England? Are you this or that folks? Not much change. <laughs> you know, what is the English church but Catholicism with divorce, as people like to say? It's not quite true, but, you know, you get the picture. Agenda <laughs> for future planning, study, and research in mission. Why do we have missions? To enculturate. Why do we put churches in different countries and societies? To enculturate. It was this agenda which identified proclamation, dialogue, enculturation, and liberation of the poor as the main activities of mission. Trends in mission toward the third millennium, essays in celebration of 25 years of Sados. Enculturation is a major concern in contemporary African Catholic theology. An African moral theology of enculturation methodological considerations. So maybe I'm overstating the point here by giving all these examples, but you really have to understand how you've been enculturated, both by the state and by the church. The state, of course, 
enculturate you that you must have the state as your government, that you cannot govern yourself. The church replaces God often with human form (laughs) and takes you away from your connection to reality, to truth, to nature, which is God. This is our problem. We've been enculturated from both sides because why? Because the church and state are wed. If there is one thing I can assure you of, it's that Jesus Christ did not teach enculturation in any way. Enculturation ultimately is and can only be globalism, or in other words, political and theological universalism. And this makes sense considering the word Catholic simply means universal. Look it up. This mass enculturation of today into Caesar's districts, that is nations, legal districts, is a globalist, secular citizenship, a socialized membership to legal hell, which simply means a debtor's prison, or, as we're so often warned against, a one-world religion and government, the new world or secular order. You can look up hell in Black's fourth edition and you can see that hell was what was called the prison for debtors underneath the executor of the king. The executor uh, represented by the chessboard was the tax collector, essentially the guy who counted the, uh, the institution, if you will. So you had a prison and it was called hell and it was a debtor's prison. I'm not just making that up. Enculturation or cultivation... And by cultivation, you know, think of the seed. Think of the uh, metaphor of the wheat and the tares. We are the tares, in other words, the plants that give no viable seed, uh, right? And we have no issue, no, no blood right in our children. We abandon our children, and therefore we have no seed. We have no bloodline. The cultivation of the tares, which is basically enculturation, is only needed for that which is not founded upon or grounded in truth. Culture is, generally speaking, always antagonistic towards truth. Worshipping truth and living truth are not the same thing. There is no need to cause the enculturation of truth, for truth is already self-evident, it already is there, It's not man-made. But such local lies can cloud perspective, and the spirit can be tempted in such a way that truth interferes with culture, and therefore truth is abandoned, discarded, and even demonized. And when I say that, I mean God is abandoned. If religions actually practiced truth, Jehovah, in the worship of the spirit of what they call as God, then no religion would be needed. For no other doctrine, that is law, But the Bible, as the story of the Word of God, the law of God, would be required. The term culture means to cultivate the mind. Mold is also a culture, often caused by similarly unnaturally controlled or man-made conditions representing a bypassing of the law of nature. All cultures of man are, of course, temporary. This is the law of nature. To be more clear, all cultures of man are positive, meaning they do not emanate from nature and therefore must be positively applied and continuously nurtured and reinforced. Just as the legal law of man would die without belief, that is, faith, and voluntary participation in that legal system. All cultures are systems, and it's very important to understand there are no systems in nature. Systems are a man-made concept, an organizational tool, if you will. Their goal is to promote the false law and doctrine of man-made things, fictions, commerce, and religious nonsense. The word nonsense here is used to describe that which is not self-evident, not of a true and therefore spiritually founded perception, what is not of the spirit of creator or truth of creation. Well, we'll choose this point to uh, take a pause, take a breather, and part number three will then be posted next week. Uh, Hope you're enjoying this deep dive into the world of the straw man and truly what it means to be incorporated, to have your spirit separated from your mind and your body. I hope this 
now makes sense. And now maybe you can understand why it is that we feel so entrapped, so absolutely stuck in this simulation. Now, again, I want you to remember simulation has one and only one meaning. And that's hypocrisy. Simulation only extends from one source, and that is you. No matter how great the computer algorithms get, no matter how great virtual reality seems, or how real it seems, it never will be. And it relies on your own hypocrisy to stand and to have power, to have authority, to have meaning, existence. It relies on your hypocrisy, your ability and your desire to step out of the real world, away from the truth and its law, and enter into that artificial construct. Now, that can be said about all these systems, legal system included. It's very important to understand, yes, the legal system is a state of organized, protected, securitized protection for hypocrites. That's what we have become. We've become so hypocritical that it's become a part of our life. And that's really the message that's being put forward here. And there is no fix to this, folks. There's no legal fix. You can't correct a system that is designed to be against God, against truth, that is supportive of organized crime in every facet. You can't fix that, folks. You must do what? You must abandon it. You must quit claiming it. You must stop being artificial and start being what you truly are. And with that said, we'll continue next week. Thanks so much for listening. Take care.